Good morning, everybody, and welcome into another episode of Morning Ritual, our TTRPG talk show. I'm one of your hosts, Anita. I'm a remarkably awake and cogent, um, considering. Uh, but hello, uh, <laughs> down here is. Let's 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 get started. Who, who's oh oh the okay host? yeah fuck all right yeah I'll do it. Smooth transition. Hey, everybody, I'm Noir. I go by he, they. You can find me all over the internet as the Noir Nigma. That's Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram. I've been up since four in the morning because I don't know time zones well. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm pretty awake. Um, and we've got a special, we've got a special guest for you today. Uh, you, you may not realize it, but I'm wearing this, uh, this entire fit out of uh, spite and redemption. <laughs> oh yeah, no. By by the way, <laughs> get fucked. There's a whole story behind this, and I'm sure we'll tell it to oh, you. Oh no, we're absolutely gonna get into that, man. <laughs> but we've got a special guest today, Trevor. Go ahead and tell the folks who you are and where they can find you. Hi, I'm Trevor Valley. Um, I am a uh, it, it flops uh, depending on the week. I am a paleontologist and a professional dungeon master. I've been in the whole RPG scene since I was very, very young, a very, very long time ago. I just like to say 40 plus years without giving away my age. <laughs> and um, I am also the creative director for the Wizards of the Coastline. Uh, for geeky jerseys, that's where these beautiful things are coming from. Um, so the you know Magic Gathering, Dungeons and Dragons, things. Like that. Uh, you can find me online uh, pretty much solely on Twitter at Tattoos and Bones. I don't believe in Facebook. I do have a Blue Sky thing, but that's still doing whatever it's doing. And uh, my Instagram is also at Tattoos and Bones, but I don't use it very often. Uh, other than that. Um, I should probably probably should talk about the streams I'm on real quick. Dutch, right? Yeah, you're, um, you're on some really good ones, too. On on Monday, I'm on negative <laughs> two charisma um, for the uh, for the continuing campaign called A Sinner's Dream It is a fifth edition game, but it's based in a 1940s noir inspired. No, you know, nothing to do with noir here. But uh, French no uh, noir style, esoteric terror, terror and dread uh, style thing where I play uh, Mac Belmont. He is a minotaur gunslinger, so a, little, a literal cowboy. And then <laughs> on Wednesdays, coming back on uh, May 31st. So, God, is that like next week or two weeks from now? Oh, crap. Uh, Wednesdays, I'm on Open Circuit Studios. I don't know where my head is. <laughs> um, I'm on Open Circuit Studios as the uh, storyteller for Leverage Los Angeles, based on the television show using the Cortex Plus system and the Leverage RPG. And yeah, it's a hell of a lot of fun. I've been talking for way too long. I, I have to tell you that that leverage game is so fun and so cool. Like watching y'all play that is has always been a blast. And uh, I, I'm a, I'm a leverage dork. I love that show. So uh, just, it's, it's great true. to see it given some love. It's, it's so much fun. <laughs> it really is every single week. Cause, um, yeah, might as well just get into that leverage. I was approached by Maz of open circuit studios, brand new, brand new platform. Don't have a lot of people on it. Uh, not a lot of people watch the show. So hopefully you'll tune in on Wednesdays. Um, it's 5 PM Pacific, by the way. Um, and I try and structure a season like an, like a season of leverage, but kind of also like an episode of leverage. Leverage is done on a five act system. So you have a build up, a plateau, the twist, a second plateau, and then the denouement, the closure. So I try and build both episode and season around that concept. So mid season, something horrible happens. And then hopefully they, they, uh, help the client by the end of the end of the season. We, we do specific length seasons just to kind of put the pressure on the crew. And I try and end every episode, uh, very cinematically using terms like the camera pans out, or we see a, that kind of thing to bring the audience a little bit more into it. 
but I also try and leave it on the cliffhanger. Like, and Donnie's cell phone buzzes or something like that. It's a lot of fun. I really enjoy that fucking game. Hell yeah! I, 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 I it's kind of interesting talking about the the format of leverage, um, it, just because I'm so used to you know the the normal story narrative, which is you know your your uh, initial incident, rising action, climax, uh, falling action, uh, uh, resolution, to hear mm-hmm. a different structure. Uh, yeah, that everything. I, I, I kind of love that. Yeah, everything crammed into a three act thing of build peak and that's switching it up and stretching it out is what made the leverage series so fun yeah and because you'll have like nathan run into somebody and then you think that's the client but it turns out that the client is act uh, the client is actually that person's father whose person is who's like being blackmailed by someone but then the you know the third the third part of it is actually that guy's being blackmailed or doing like that and there's there's an accomplice and then you have to take down the accomplice and it turns out it was the original client that was being the problem and it was the daughter it's just like it's this cool parabolic arc um with a oh fuck what's happening right in the middle i love it it's so much fun Oh, I, I love that. But, like, I'm, I'm going to have to play with that kind of story structure because I'm so used to doing the traditional that it, it's just, like, kind of building within a different format. Uh, I think that's a great exercise for GMs to kind of take a step back, look at how stories are built and try different ways of building them. Uh, I, I think that's really cool. But uh, I have to say, you have a hell of an interest. Like, a lot of people come on here, they can say, like, I'm a game designer, I'm a producer, I do actual plays. Never I never had paleontologists. Like, that's... <laughs> there, there's honestly not a lot of us. Um, uh, I think, like, the yearly... So every year we have the Society for Vertebrate Paleontology. It's just like uh, like, every paleontologist shows up in whatever the host city is, and we hang out for a couple of days, and present new papers and posters and academic things. And at night we just party. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I think the highest, I, I think it was some like 2,800 people were there one year. So it's not a lot. Um, there's some sprinkled throughout the world, but um, at least those are the recognizable ones. I work in a weird form of paleontology. And just so everybody watching or who will watch the VOD and all that, paleontology is an archaeology. So archaeology deals with the the, the two get confused all the time. Um, No shit. I say differences. Yeah, I I say I'm a paleontologist and they're like, oh, I took anthropology in college, too. It's people versus. Prehistoric animals. Prehistoric animals. So uh, archaeologists dig up people, cultures and all that paleontologists don't dig people that's both true and a fun little thing like a patch i have on my hard hat and <laughs> we're, we je- we tend to be you know hanging around with other paleontologists who are very antisocial. um <laughs> um so what i do specifically is i'm what's called a mitigation paleo so i go to any um Why? It's just aphasia. The fucking everything in my brain always screws. Right. Uh, Construction sites. I look down. I'm like, that's my replica skull. Here's my tape measure. Okay. Mitigation pale. I go to construction sites. Uh, We'll talk about why my brain does that later. Um, I go to construction (laughs) sites and I monitor them to make sure that they don't uh, accidentally dig up or destroy or do anything with any fossils. So if there's construction in a fossiliferous layer or where found where fossils have been found before or a geologic layer that uh, fossils have been found before, I'm supposed to be there and I watch buckets of dirt and bulldozers and large uh, like dozens of ton machines that I'm extremely close to by extremely close. I have to uh, I have to have a special like, no, really, I'm breaking OSHA standards kind of thing on me Um, (laughs) because I have to get into holes where hydraulic shovels are digging and stuff like that in case they find something. 
when they find something or if they find something um, is the better way to put that. Uh, I get to stop the project and get like literally get out my dental picks and brushes, try and figure out what it is. If it's something big, I excavate it, uh, wrap a plaster cast around it and take it for prep. If it's something small, I put it in a little paper bag and uh, write the GPS coordinates where in the project is. And I can say, yeah, go ahead. Um, God, was it last year? I think last year in the fall, uh, I got to stop a two and a half billion dollar project. He stopped it. Yep. They couldn't continue because they were excavating. They the Their final excavation was in one area. So there there's a, a shoring boards or large boards. So they sink I-beams into the ground, and then they put shoring boards in between the I-beams to hold all the material back and put these huge lag bolts in there to keep it from moving, fill it full of concrete slurry. That's to prevent the wall from collapsing in when they're digging down a really far. And we were going down some like 65 feet mm -hmm. and I found a fossil deposit and that was the only place they had left to dig. So I held up a two and a half billion dollar project for three days. Well, I'm glad you made it out of that alive. Cause <laughs> oh, you start, I've, I've gotten death threats. I've gotten Holy people shit. hanging out over me going, are you done yet? Are you done yet? Are you done yet? Um, supervisors, foremen, uh, even general contractors and supervising contractors for the entire project go, when are you going to be done? And I get to snap back when I am. <laughs> so to, to just so I'm understanding this, they were, what was the project? Were they building something like a building or something? They were building an extremely large building in an area I can't talk about because right. I'm, um, and, uh, uh, I can't one, it's a construction site. So it's authorized personnel only mm -hmm. Two, in case other fossils are found while the companies I am contracted through have monitors on site. There's the possibility that someone can break in and steal fossils. Yeah. Oh, so wow. un until our, until our part is done and we are cleared in our paperwork that we can talk about it, then I can talk about it. other so things. Yeah. Other things I've worked on. Um, yeah. There was an apartment building here in Los Angeles uh, near Good Samaritan Hospital where I found because the apartment buildings built. Um, uh, I asked them if they could uh, cut me a deal on moving in there. They're like, no. Um, I found a fossil coral reef uh, half of a way um a miocene so uh uh right around uh 12 12 million years old roughly uh whale Ooh. whale rib cage and 400 shark teeth including the meg tooth that is tattooed on my arm uh, <laughs> that that's why my that's why my handles tattoos and bones by the way because i'm the tattooed paleontologist so i basically <laughs> have my resume tattooed on my body so, so just to make sure I'm understanding this, whenever somebody is building a building, they have to have, they have to report to archaeologists in just in case they find something. Uh, yes, yeah, uh, so arche ar archaeology surveys as well. I, I know a little bit about this because my ex was training to be uh, an anthropologist as well, and actually had to do uh, survey plots uh, to make sure that to clear sites to make sure that they didn't have any uh, historical or like that sort of uh, connotation. So yeah, that was what uh, yeah. that was a job that uh, they had for the summer. Wow! Yeah, I, absolutely. I never knew that aspect of archaeology. So if and it's an untouched area, mm -hmm. yeah, and and paleontology and biology, actually, I've oh. worked in I've worked a number of solar farms throughout California and Nevada, and um, and one in Arizona, but it was really tiny. So when you're working on undisturbed land. First, the biologists go out, and in this case, in solar farms, they're doing things like marking uh, where desert tortoise burrows may be, or endangered uh, Coachella fringe-toed lizards, or different, um, you know, different endangered bushes. Because the Mojave Desert and Colorado and Sonoran deserts here in Cal in Southwest, uh, Southeast California, um, are there are sections of them that are federally, both state and federally protected. So they have to go out and mark everything. And then archaeologists look up and say, okay, there was tribal activity 
in uh so there's all there's uh contracted archaeologists and tribal archaeologists that oh. have to go out and then once everything's done the paleontologists get to go out mark where they are and go okay this is on top of a holocene or a modern alluvial plain so everything was coming down off the mountains there's no fossils that are going to be here but just in case they go deeper uh, right. And then we hang out and then we do things like se spend seven months in armpits of California, like towns called Blythe. <laughs> <laughs> Blythe is the easternmost. No, no yeah. fist anybody for Blythe, but that just sounds. You know, no, Blythe, so Blythe is saying blight with a lisp. Um, Blythe, I think, was founded by accident, probably <laughs> because somebody's car broke down. Um. <laughs> If anybody watching is from Blythe, and I dare, I I dare that you actually are, and I don't think anyone is because the internet connectivity out there is dog shit. Um, <laughs> Blythe is the last town in California on the on Highway Ten on Interstate Ten. Um, so if you're ever low on gas and you're going east on the Ten, if you have more than a mile left. Cross the border into Arizona. Go to Ehrenberg. One, the gas prices are lower. Two, they actually have things like actual connectivity. Um, yeah, no, Blythe, Blythe is a cosmic. Blythe sounds like you shit. have sand in your mouth. Yeah. Oh, and and it's like I've posted pictures on my on my Twitter, and I'll do it. Uh, I'll do it later today after the show. Um, of me in a five mile wide sandstorm in the middle of a solar project. It's my goggles. I've got like a bandana wrapped. I'm zipped up. It's just like everything's like, hey, look, it's me. I'm getting blown away and possibly dying. I can't see anything. Can you see me on the camera? I don't know. It's yeah, it, that's Blythe. Life, life is a hellhole. A lot of places with bees in California are just shitty. Life, <laughs> Button Willow, Bakersfield, Brentwood. Well, Burbank is cool. Yeah, yeah. Bur Burbank is my favorite spot. If, yeah, if Guild Guild Hall, roguelike, Critical Role. Um, yeah, that, that's a fun place. But yeah, that's Geeky basically tees. Geeky Tees. Thank you. Um, that where uh, where the hats are from. <laughs> um, but I mean... yeah, that's paleontology in a nutshell. And uh, I got into mitigation paleontology because I used to be the lab supervisor at the uh, at the La Brea Tar Pits. And I was just about to ask how you got into it. Yeah, that's that's why I've got the saber tooth cat uh, stylized saber tooth cat logo on my arm. Again, resume. Um, I actually fell into paleontology. I like to say I <laughs> side loaded or I slipped into it, or in the wise words of. Uh, Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett, I sauntered vaguely downwards um, <laughs> into it. So I am I am a biologist, first of all, a herpetologist, and uh, I study lizards, snakes, things like that. <laughs> and I, uh, my first professional job was working at the Aquarium of the Pacific here in Long Beach, here in California. And the Aquarium of the Pacific had a cool event called, um, it was either... Weird Wild, no, Dazzling and Dangerous was the first one, and then Weird Wild and Wonderful was the second one, I think. So the P Aquarium of the Pacific is everything based on or influencing the Pacific Ocean. Fucking massive body of water. So this one was how the local land, how dust storms from the Mojave deposit nutrients in the ocean, run off. Um, everything from fire, land erosion, everything like that. So they had a whole bunch of animals from these from these biomes, including reptiles. So I'm like, hey, and I applied for the husbandry position, and I got it. It was a temp job, so I found out. And I met the, the, the animals were on loan from the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. So I was taking care of them, and I was doing some diving, taking care of other cool signathids, um, like seahorses and stuff like that. Then they changed to the Weird, Wild, and Wonderful. And then I had an option. They had an open call for exhibit. I, I pitched two things. One, 
uh, an encounter called, uh, it was like cool crabs or, you know, it was uh, secret shell life. It was all about crabs and crustaceans and all that, which would have been cool. The other one was Australia wanders down under because we never talked about Australia, even though the Pacific Ocean touches it. Right. And I contacted the Australia Zoo, Steve Irwin's old place, and said, hey, I want to do this at the Aquarium of the Pacific. This is what I want to pitch. And they're like, cool, we'll, we'll go in on it too. They decided, even though here I am handing, handing the board of directors here, Australia Zoo, saltwater crocodiles. We just have to build a new enclosure. You know, it's like cost will be split. It'd be fucking rad. Uh, they decided to go with surf and surf culture. So they got rid of an entire gallery of animals, tanks, and the whole thing, parked a 1950s Woody in it, surfboards, and played Dick Dale music. <laughs> um, I resigned shortly thereafter. <laughs> I can imagine. And on the way home, I got a call from Natural History saying, we don't mean to headhunt you, but if you want to come to Living Collections... Uh, I do have a position opening and I'm like, cool. I just, I just quit. So I'll be there in 15 minutes and yeah, <laughs> started working at the, uh, natural history museum doing, uh, live animals and education. And then the dinosaur Institute went, Hey, you know, you have an osteology background studying bones. Um, do you want to like clean fossils like this triceratops skull? I'm like, fuck yeah. And then <laughs> I realized I picked later, the right mug for this one. <laughs> oh nice uh protoser no oh, pa oh yeah pa it's pa from the royal yeah. museum oh 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 the oh god albert is so good it's one of the few i haven't been to it's it is it's one of my favorite <laughs> so places on the planet is the royal it's Thurell. so good i'm i'm planning on actually taking anita to the field museum next week oh so i can see non-binary icons sue <laughs> yes, yes, Sue is amazing. But yeah, so I, uh, uh, sorry, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go uh, ahead. Uh, it's, it's like Letter Kenny. How are you now? It's like good, you. <laughs> but it's like, um, so a, a year later, they're like, "Hey, do you want to be the assistant lab supervisor of the La Brea Tar Pits?" I'm like, "Uh, you're not really a paleontologist." And I'm like, now you are. <laughs> so yeah and then i just moved up into the ranks and then i asked for more money and then they said no and then i quit <laughs> and i became a mitigation paleontologist after spending eight weeks in siberia digging up wood. so i i'm never gonna have another chance to ask this so i have to as a paleontologist how do you feel about the jurassic park series <laughs> How long is this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> I'd say also wearing a Jurassic Park shirt. I realized <laughs> somehow I picked. You knew the assignment. I did. If you're not in uniform, that's the only acceptable substitute. <laughs> okay. Well, to be fair, I was never into dinosaurs as a kid. Okay. I liked I liked going to museums. The Page Museum was one of the first museums I went to on a school field trip. And, like dinosaur skeletons were cool and all but no fuck that i wanted to fly the space shuttle so yeah. i oh oh yeah uh my mom would keep me home sorry i may get emotional during the story but okay. uh, my mom would keep me home uh from school the mornings of shuttle launches so i could watch oh. um oh. we we tried to go to uh, one of the landings that happened at Edwards Air Force Base, but the traffic got too bad, so we had to turn around. Um, my whole dream was to be an astronaut. I went to space camp four times. Wow. Space camp, space academy, space academy level two, and aviation challenge. Um, my Ooh. entire goal in life was to fly the space shuttle. Suffice to say, since I'm not an astronaut, things went sideways, um, which I won't get into. But um, I fell on plan B and then plan C and then plan D. And to the point where I'm here now. Pl but this was plan D for dinosaurs. <laughs> I'm so um, sorry. No, no. <laughs> plan D is damage control. Um, okay. <laughs> I, I think I'm actually on like plan Q at this point for, you know, for just quit. 
Uh, but <laughs> his burnout and shit. Um, I thought Plan B was burnout, but no. Um, so I was never really into dinosaurs. In 1993, I went and saw Jurassic Park, and I'm like, eh, it's a cool <laughs> monster movie, but the science doesn't make sense. It's kind of silly. The, you know, it's like tyrannosaurs don't. Because I knew a little bit. Right. As I grew in paleontology, I kept looking back going, wow, all this shit is just so wrong. And then I decided to turn a very critical eye toward it. I, as, as a monster movie, it's cool. It's Steven Spielberg. So it's basically Jaws on land. land um, so yeah, land shark. <laughs> that, that's it. A whole, a whole bunch of land sharks. It's like, it's like kindergram for Mrs. <laughs> um, for, for those that are young. That's a Saturday Night Live joke. It's the only good thing old, Chevy Chase did. Oh my god! Yes. <laughs> um, the only the or, or like the first Fletch film and maybe Three Amigos, but yeah. that was mainly Martin Short and Steve Martin. But so, or as I'd like to say, Steve Martin Short. <laughs> um, but it, it's a monster movie, and it's like it's a fun monster movie. But once I put my science hat on. I have ripped it to shreds in 20 minute talks for nerd night nationwide. Um, oh, I got to get talks. you in a room with Sam. Sam DeLive is also our science friend. And they tear movies to shreds. Uh, you're on. <laughs> I mean, just let's fucking go. Because unlike certain extremely large Twitter accounts of scientists who are astrophysicists who have absolutely zero sense of humor. You all should know who I'm talking about, but I won't name names. <laughs> um, uh, I don't, I, I appreciate movies for what they are. Movies and cinema are a long, you know, are, are, are long, well-held, just like critical aspect of art. Since, the you know since the early moving pictures of horses running um from yeah you know from silent pictures to modern day cgi things like the fucking dungeons and dragons movie or avatar well the the D &D used a lot of practical effects but you know what i mean yeah um yeah it, it's been art and escapism and visual storytelling and narrative movies are awesome I can appreciate a movie for what it is. The moment somebody asked me, so how did you like Jurassic Park? I'm at an impasse. It, you know, it's a pretty good monster movie. Do you want me to turn my paleontologist, put my paleontologist hat on? It's a fucking garbage fire and I despise it. Let <laughs> <laughs> the mosquito and the amber don't do it for you? No. No, because so, so the, the, the entire premise is garbage. <laughs> because while yes you can find a mosquito in amber will it be from exactly 60 60 65 million years ago before a big fuck all asteroid hit the you know uh, hit the yucatan peninsula and killed off 70 percent of all life on the planet uh probably not um because you know sap producing trees weren't really yeah we'll get into that that that's that's an entirely different paper but that oh. so so that specific mosquito has to have intact blood intact blood cells from a specific species of dinosaur then poor intern has to drill into the amber and not fuck it up and then they have to extract the blood. It would be an intern too, wouldn't oh, 100%. it? 100%. <laughs> yeah, for the first <laughs> drilling into the amber, it's some grad student. It's like, you know, and 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 the professors are like, what you want to do is just go into the amber. And I'm speaking about a former professor I had, again, nameless. <laughs> and what you want to drill almost to the mosquito. And then we will take over from there. Um... Wow, dude, he was an asshole. Anyway, um, <laughs> so that, that one species, that one mosquito had to get that one, one dinosaur species of blood. 
Let's say it fed on two and it has two somehow discernible uh, uh, intact blood vessels of two different species. Then that blood vessel has to be, or that, that blood cell has to be pulled out intact, which it probably isn't because of shit frozen in amber. It's crystallized. Um, that would be very difficult. And then you pull it out. Then you have to somehow sequence that entire genome, figure out shit's missing, go back to a um, either a previous ancestor that you happen to have genetic a genetic code for, which you don't, or go to a modern ancestor, which frogs aren't. Um, it's like you want a T-Rex or a Velociraptor? Go get a fucking bird. Why? Why are you doing like frog DNA? <laughs> It's like that that makes no sense. And then but that that's that has to happen for each species. Yeah. Oh Unless God. they are the greatest sci-fi geneticists known to humanity that could take the the genome of say like a, a fucking triceratops and go, well, if we just tweak this shit, we've got a T-Rex. No. It's not how that works. So, yeah, the entire premise is fucking garbage. <laughs> the only good thing out of the whole, like, you know, uh, like, movie sequence in the official movie is like, hi, kids, I'm Mr. DNA. That's the only cool thing because it reminds me of the of um, the paperclip from Win from Microsoft Windows Word. Windows Clippy. Clippy. Yeah, it's like, can I help you open a I document? Let's talk about DNA. I, I hear you're trying to clone a dinosaur. Can I help you with that? <laughs> exactly um but yeah then the then the movies got progressively worse uh then we've got the new crop of them um that are also just like really that chris running in heels um a 600 meter long uh, they broke their rule Mosasaur? too yes yes they, they, they did. broke Let's... their one rule What's uh, their one rule in their in the original jurassic park movies women never die Women and femmes never die, because that's the that's the whole point of the shirt. God creates dinosaur. Dinosaur. Uh, dis God destroys dinosaur. God creates man. Man destroys God. Man creates dinosaur. Creates dinosaur. Dinosaurs eat man. Women inherit, women inherit the yep. earth. So yep. the rule in the original Jurassic Park series is femmes never die. In the new crop of Jurassic Park movies, uh, Bryce is Bryce Dallas Howard's in it. Yep. Yeah. The, uh, her assistant gets brutally murdered. Her female assistant gets brutally, brutally murdered. Yeah, like halfway like, through the movie. Like torn apart by dinosaurs. I, yeah, I, picked, up, uh, picked up picked up by a pteranodon, which, by the way, can't happen. Um, because, you know, whole... Uh, it, it's, it's basically the Monty Python thing <laughs> of, like, a swallow uh, and a coconut. Yeah. Tur you know, pteranosaurs could... Or, sorry, uh, pterosaurs could not pick up people. So yeah, her, she's picked up, the, the pteranodon is starting to panic, and then the mosasaur comes up and eats the pteranodon and the assistant. Yeah. It's just like, what? They they broke the rule. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's one of the reasons I don't, I, have, I haven't watched a Jurassic Park movie since. Yeah, I stopped watching oh, Jurassic this. Park when a, a, a Velociraptor was defeated by a gymnastics routine. Uh, I, I was just like, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> uh, those were also weren't Velociraptors, by the way. They oh. were too big. <laughs> yeah, um, too way too big. Yeah, so, size of chickens. Yeah, the uh, the original book, Michael Crichton, uh, he did some decent research on it, and he wanted to. Uh, so the Utah Raptor was brand new and hadn't really been talked about yet when he was writing the book. But Deinonychus, but you know, large, uh, it's a large, um, uh, fuck, why can't I think of Dromaeosaur, um, where the raptors, uh, the, the raptor lineage. And, you know, big sickle toe, the whole deal. Deinonychus doesn't sound cool, but Velociraptor does. So Michael Crichton used the term Velociraptor, and there was some debate whether or not it was a big Velociraptor or any one. In the opening scenes of Jurassic Park, Alan Grant is in Hell Creek, Montana, and discovers a Velociraptor. Number one, the species name for Velociraptor is Mongoliensis, meaning it's found in Mongolia, 
not fucking Montana. <laughs> Two, if a if a Velociraptor was standing on this table, it would be about and my the table is like this high. It's just had a camera shot, or actually, you know, it would be about you know paper towel, a little bit higher than this paper towel, and about four feet long. That's it. That, that, that's from nose to tip of tail. They're angry turkeys. <laughs> so, had a real velociraptor been used, the children protagonists in the first film would have been, velociraptors are coming into the kitchen. Quick, hit one with a frying pan or kick it out of the way. <laughs> yeah, no, they're, they're small. I yeah. actually have a whole talk about... That's not a, it's actually called That's Not a Fucking Dinosaur that I do for Nerd Night. And half of it is what is a dinosaur, what is not. And the other half is what is not a actual dinosaur in film, uh, television, and uh, popular media. So it's like, this is not that dinosaur. That's still not a dinosaur. Don't even get me started on Barney and, you know, stuff like that. (laughs) What the fuck kind of dinosaur is Barney supposed to be anyway? Uh, like I I a, never really got that. <laughs> like a very friendly tyrannosaur yeah. because of like the size of the body, but his best friend was a triceratops. Yeah. Um I mean it that's why Land Before Time with how beautiful it is. No. <laughs> no. The 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 big tooths or whatever the hell they're called. Sharp tooth. Would like sharp thank you. They would have a really really strong desire to rip their uh little herbivore friends apart because that's what they eat like it, it's like asking it's like asking a cat to live with a prey item and just go <laughs> oh look it's batting it around it's playing oh my god you know yeah it's 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 not going to happen very often oh so this- this answer yeah. was everything I hoped it would be. <laughs> yeah, I found a graphic that I used in my uh, used in my talk where it's like Barney, and I think it was Sarah was the Triceratops. Yeah, I'm not 100 yeah, percent. Or is. Trixie, maybe Barney and Trixie. Uh, it doesn't matter, but it's just like them, like <laughs> hey kids, and then I'm like, if a paleontologist was consulted and Cracked.com did this image. Of a bright green tyrannosaur, busting Baby Bop out. is her name. There's Baby Bop, and there's also BJ. Really, man, <laughs> I'm glad I was too old for that shit. <laughs> anyway, big green tyrannosaur, like standing over the carcass of a bleeding out purple triceratops, and kids running, and it just says, "If paleontologists were consulted," um, I'm just like, "Fuck yeah, man." Uh, tri- man, Triceratops sounds more hardcore than they've been perceived. Oh, Triceratops was was very hardcore. Like <laughs> Triceratops means three horned face, has two massive horns, uh, brow horns over its eyes, and a nose horn, and this big frill protecting the back of its neck. These things, one, were huge. They were about a per- like a really tall person would kind of come up to its hip. But then its skull is one of the largest skulls in the you know that's ever existed. These dinosaurs are really fucking good. What do you think about the theory and, that triceratops are sorry uh, are no, no, actually don't. like a uh, a there's the, there was a theory that uh, it's a lot of the seropod cer- uh, type dinosaurs or ceratopsians were uh, actually the same fossil but in different age ranges. What do you think? Ah, uh, yes. Um, yeah, that, that was put, that was put together by a very well-known paleontologist, the same one that said T-Rex was a scavenger. Um, look it up. And he stated that Triceratops was a juvenile form of Taurosaurus. Taurosaurus is a very, has a very large frill, two big holes in it. Uh, not sure what the holes did. Maybe it was to aid in. Uh, thermal regulation maybe it was, they were display air sacs who who the hell knows uh because we don't find them with skin on them um <laughs> that was completely and utterly false and the majority of the paleontology community went what the fuck 
<laughs> because we have found so there's there's a way to actually age bones um not not in what date they're from but how old they are so and it people animals the same thing when you're born you're you're basically a jelly filled sack of meat with bones that need to grow yeah because they need to grow say like your your femur your thigh bone you have your thigh bone and then you have two bits of it called epiphyses which are not fused they're connected with cartilage so they can grow too because the whole bone can't grow at the same time as a child and as a young adult, those epiphyses are not connected to the thigh bone, to the femur. When you reach an adult and the cartilage begins to ossify, that is when you have the complete femur with the epiphyses mm -hmm. uh, locked into it and calcified. We have found juvenile triceratops with no epiphyses and all of that. We have found adult triceratops with their epiphyses fused that are old, that have scarring on the bones from large animals trying to bite through their legs and stuff like that. We have also found juvenile Taurosaurus and adult Taurosaurus. So that paleontologist was wrong. Cool. Good to know. <laughs> there, are a couple, there are a couple dinosaurs that may be different, um, different growth stages. I think one is... Um, uh, uh, Pachycephalosaurus uh, that may have two younger growth stages, uh, Dracorex, and I forget what the other one is. But those may be part of the same growth series, but again, running into trouble with either incomplete skeletons to mm. uh, to confirm that, or the, uh, you know, like it, it's some have a uh, 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 epiphyses that are calcifying some don't it's it's all fucking weird because we're, we're we're not dealing with like sometimes we find huge bone beds full of like 32 of the same dinosaur plus eggs and all that cool shit other time it's like i found part of a skull and that's it yeah i don't know what the fuck it is <laughs> so yeah we, we're estimating that one to two percent of like the entire like amount of species that were living at the time are probably fossilized. So just to switch gears a little bit here, like one of the things I love the most about science is science thrives on mistakes and people being wrong because that's how you end up finding the right answer. And that is, that is, you know, that is the world you live in. Oh, uh, but the world you play in is a TTRPG space. Yeah. Which seems to have an issue with people being wrong and in science it, it, it almost feels like mistakes are embraced so that course correction can then take place. Yes. In the world of social media, however, mistakes <laughs> are attacked and fed on. Uh, yeah. I wonder how, how do you reconcile that being of both of these worlds? I don't know if that question makes sense. Oh, no, it does. Okay. So I have, if, if you scroll through my Twitter feed, it is two very distinct, uh, distinct Trevors. One is the scientist who occasionally has. So um, before, before I preface this as if it was an attack on religion, it is not <laughs> because I am, uh, I'm Jewish. I am a Jew, like menorahs, Passover, like reformed Jew. So, if you're anti-Semitic, fuck off and leave the stream. If you're not, cool, hang out. So, I never attack religions. Because everybody, everybody has their own choice in faith. Faith is a very integral part to the human being. Because faith gets you through things. <laughs> faith, uh, you know, uh, faith could lead you to good and bad things. It's done horrible things in the name of faith it's been it's done amazing things but faith is a very personal intrinsic thing for everybody whether they have it or not so when i get into a scientific debate say with a creationist i never attack their faith i never say oh you you listen to bronze age goat herders or shit like that 
Yeah. I attack their claims of 6,000 year old earth or anything. I never, I never question Genesis. The only time I do is when they go, well, you've never read the Bible. It's like, motherfucker, how many copies of the Tanakh do you think I have? I probably know the Torah better than you. <laughs> um, that's the only time I do that, but I never attack someone's faith. Yeah. Right. That's my scientist side. And it's like, oh, cool. Here's a new paper on this. Here's a new paper on that. I get retweeted some guy saying the earth is flat. I'm like, oh, yeah, come fucking on. Um, but when it comes to TTRPG, Trevor, I am 100% a yes and sort of, sort of person. And I, I like the yes and, and I am... I'm of two minds about the tabletop role-playing game space. Uh, one, I refuse, refuse to call it a community because a community is defined as a group of people with a common intent. And we are not a group of people with common intents. True. No. There is, there is the yes and fifth edition, you know, group groups like that that are like D and D is cool and we need to change it because of misogyny, racial stereotypes and things like that. Then you have the OSR folk that are like, fuck that. And all that you've got the pathfinder folks that are like, just abandon all your games and come play us. The indie folks that are like, no, abandon all the ma mainstream games and come play us. So there are, there are integrated silos in this community. So maybe there are smaller communities. Sure but there's yeah. infighting in all of them, but there's a larger space. I try and keep the two Trevors as separate as I can, <laughs> but there is occasional bleed through. I was asked by Atlas games to create and write uh, dinosaurs for the Plangea uh, campaign setting for fifth edition. And I got to bring science into D and D. I've always made like the stat blocks for animals and beasts and dinosaurs and shit like that for non mythical creatures uh, in every edition of Dungeons and Dragons going back to the fucking white box have been garbage. Yeah, absolute garbage. It's like, oh, the T-Rex can bite you and maybe do a tail strike. Motherfucker, this thing weighs nine tons. It will step on you, body slam you, grab you by the mouth, throw you and and have a form of frightening presence when it roars. So those are my, never play in my game. If you want to play one of my dinosaurs, if you want to meet one of my dinosaurs, it will fuck you up. <laughs> so I combine my science and paleo science, science or paleontology and science and role-playing games that way. Um, but I tend to turn off that I tend to turn off and embrace a heavy amount of verisimilitude because yeah, a science, a, a strictly science brain cannot grasp the concept of magical weeds or, uh, or, you know, sci-fi races or, um, different, different species of, uh, intelligent plants that speak and all this like random stuff. Like you have to give that side of your brain up. Yeah. You kind of got to put it aside. Yeah, the, the only things science-wise I get involved in is, like, probabilities with dice. That's it. It's like, cool, every time I roll a d20, I have a 5% chance um, to, to crit or fail miserably. But, yeah, that's that's how... Yeah, but it's... It's weird. It's a very... That's a very broad topic of of splitting the two, but I, I do my best. yeah. I, I I feel like this space could learn a lot from the scientific community, uh, mainly how to be wrong. I feel like there's a grace in the science field in that terms is, of mistakes. That is true, but there are parts of the science field, like like in the old white guy tweed suit ivory tower bullshit, there are constantly papers of, well, this paper from 2008 incorrect and then the original author of the 2008 paper goes well that rebuttal in 2012 was incorrect because of this and they do get progressively snippier 
but in an <laughs> academic setting. True. So, mm. so being wrong while a paramount of the scientific method, because that's what it is. I come up with an idea, come up with a hypothesis. I test the hypothesis. The hypothesis is wrong. I go back to square one. Right. I come up with another one. That hypothesis is right. Now we have to fiddle with it and figure more out and figure out if any laws and facts apply to it, mathematical equations or actual things. And then hopefully at some point, this unified group of, of experimentation and facts and laws and, uh, and uh, valid hypotheses become a larger, the, the overall pinnacle of scientific theory. That would be fucking rad. But so many people are fighting each other in science to be the next cool mathematician or physicist or dry as fuck astrophysicist or stuff like that. <laughs> um, I can't imagine what you're talking about. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, met him twice. Didn't like it either time. So <laughs> there there are problems like that in, in science. Occasionally, you'll see that, that science bleed in social media. But it is nowhere near the toxic cesspool bag of dicks. That is RPG fucking Twitter social media. My God. Yes. You have an opinion on it's it's the pancake waffle uh um theorem. It is I like fifth edition. You must fucking hate every other game. You're an asshole. I hate you. Fuck the man. It's like, wait, I also play Scum and Villainy, which is a Blades in the Dark game. I'm I'm working on two different uh um covers for kids on bikes. <laughs> and I've run three uh, Visigoths versus Malgoths charity games. Like, what? <laughs> yes, I've been playing D&D for 40 fucking years. But that doesn't mean that that is my soul. And, and like, that's it. Like, there are game systems that are amazing. There are other ones that are just too crunchy and I don't like. And I'm sorry. I like waffles. Fuck your pancakes. <laughs> If you it's come all about to me saying, yeah, <laughs> white, white. It's like if if you come at me like I really like waffles, and it's like pancakes are better. You're this, that, and everything. It's like fine, fuck your pancakes. I like waffles, and I'm going to continue to eat my waffles, and I'm going to crumble little candy bars and make chocolate waffles, <laughs> and then I'm going to those waffles, right? And then I'm going to homebrew my own waffle batter, and I'm going to enjoy waffles. Because I'm sorry, no, I don't like pancakes, but I'm not disparaging your pancakes until you came after my waffles. I this we we talk about the toxic cesspool of dicks that is TTRPG Twitter, and it is dicks because it's men. Men <laughs> are doing this shit. Hashtag yes, all men. Because holy <laughs> fuck! And the thing is, father, husband, gamer. Hey, <laughs> visually like like i take off my hat i move my mic i am the demograph i am the visual demographic of these assholes that's that you know that is one of the reasons why i'm probably not invited to a whole lot of games but i totally get that because i am white passing even though i am castilian spanish and latino my last name, yes, I say Valley, but it's actually Valle. Um, I am bisexual. I am disabled. But I look like a thumb with a fucking beard because I'm the bald bearded dude with tattoos. I should be having a leather vest and riding a Harley. And then I immediately start talking about, hey, I've been playing Dungeons and Dragons for 40 years. And immediately it's like, he must be a grognard. It's like, no, I hate those people. I, I, I've i personally taken a step back from Twitter myself, like I because it's it, it's gotten so unbearable. It, it, but I've 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 really been trying to take a take a time to think, like, why are we at why? Why has it become this way? And uh, I, I have some theories and I would love to hear it. what you think. No, about no, no, them. no. I want I want to hear yours. I. I believe it's be, there's the main driving 
motivation for why things have turned so fucking toxic is because one, there is a level of entitlement and two, <laughs> there is a level of jealousy for perceived for things that people perceive without knowing. Uh-huh. Uh, I think it's very easy for someone to see someone get on Dimension 20 Critical Role or let's say get invited to the Wizards Summit and think, oh, these are people that have it made. These are people that are being paid tons of dollars by WotC, you know, and like, why not me? And yeah. and I think there are people that feel that they have done more work than some people who have progressed further in this particular career, or at least that's how they're perceiving it. And I also believe that they're perceiving the rewards or the financial benefits of these things in a way that's not quite accurate. (laughs) So uh, I, again, I spoke out against the Wizards Summit, mainly because I don't trust Wizards. Um, I again, I have no beef with anybody that went. I just don't trust wizards. Um, it was never about, oh, I think the people who were invited are getting put on. But I quickly saw like my point of view being co opted by people that were saying things to the effect of everybody who's going to the wizard summit, you know, is a shill for wizards and they're being paid yep. under the table by wizards to say nothing but good yep. things about wizards, yep. which. I, you know, I have spoke, a, a lot of my friends went, and uh, I've I, spoke, I went. Yeah, I, I know, and I was, I was about to get to that, and like, I, and I've had conversations with you guys in depth about your experience, the entire process, and, you know, you guys got, a, you know, you, you got invited, you got a flight, but like, nobody was being paid under the table. No, um, no, not at all. I, and, I can tell you exactly. Uh, w- what it was. Yeah, feel Cause, free. Yeah, because we don't have fucking NDAs or anything like that, and it's well past the summit. Um, I was, I actually was given two options because I'm uh, Southern California. I wanted to drive, and they're <laughs> like, "Okay, well, you can drive and just like invoice us for the hotel and gas." I'm like. <laughs> Okay. And like, <laughs> but that's like, it's a two day drive. And I'm like, yeah, but you know, because I'm severely immunocompromised. Right. Um, like severely, uh, for those that don't know, I have two types of cancer. I'm currently fighting a uh, lower in my lower abdomen and one in my brain. So airplanes and I, during the COVID is still going around by the way. Um, uh, COVID and I, I have never, Sorry, hit my microphone. I have never had COVID ever, never had it at all. And I'm one of, uh, I, apparently a very few people have never had it, which is wild. I'd be one of them. Right on, right the fuck on. And so like the thought of a plane terrified me and I walk with a cane on good days, a walker with bad days. So I'm immediately thinking, walking through airports, getting on a plane, walking through another airport, um, you know, having to do public transportation or Uber or all that. And I'm like, fuck it. This is a one in a time chance to go to wizards, hear what they say and hold them to task. That is the thing that most of the people talking about the summit and that we were shills and shit like that. Don't understand. We were all talking before the summit. We all knew that the first, so this is the thing. The first part of the summit was supposed to be them going, Hey, this is the new VTT. This is what we actually mean by one D and D check out these offices. Here's a little bit of swag and tell us your thoughts on these things. It's Mm -hmm. like, Okay. And I was putting in questions about the upcoming Planescape setting because it's my absolute favorite of all time. And if I could speak to directors on that, I wanted to also bring up accessibility for D&D Beyond because even though the 
Character sheets have the under dark high contrast mode. The rest of the site doesn't. So when you click on a spell and take it to the thing, you're hit with fucking, you know, this blazing white background. And I actually have phone calls with the D&D uh, Beyond people coming up talking about this accessibility. So there are aspects that were listening to us. However, the latter half, which was supposed to bring up our concerns, we didn't find out until lunch that the program was going to be, here's another hour or so talking about the VTT. Yeah, we already watched, we already saw that. We got to fucking fiddle with it. And then, then it was like, oh, and next after that is going to be a talk about the uh, new fifth edition uh, rules update that could be in a fucking email or in all of the updates on D and D beyond. Why are we doing this? So it kept going. It kept going until we blew up. Right. And we took the time back because we were not having a chance. And I want to apologize to anybody that was on the virtual one, uh, the virtual side of things. One, <laughs> For billion dollar company, fuckers, I'm like, come on, Hasbro has no concept of how to do a hybrid physical virtual thing. Yeah. It, that it was entirely it was ass. I left. It was it was total <laughs> ass. They should have split them into two entirely separate things. Two, I'm also sorry for we we took over the summit. We absolutely it was a mutiny. Yeah. And we started to, to the point where the um, DEI manager was coming in and answering questions. The social uh, the social media guest relations uh, team was coming in and answering questions. We, we got answers to our questions and we have avenues for our concerns now. But to be to be hoodwinked like that, we knew something was going to happen. We didn't know it was going to be that horrible and if i if i may just step in for a second that's what my tweet was about oh my yeah no, tweet, i'm 100 i yeah, backed your tweet dude yeah i no, oh, no, I, about I know but i just want to stress it for anybody that's watching oh my, yeah because again it was co-opted there are people retweeting and quote tweeting me going like yeah and fuck all the people going and it's like right. my tweet was essentially if i could boil it down to its essence was Hey, I'm glad that y'all going. I hope that you're aware this is a trap. <laughs> right, right, hundred <laughs> percent. And we're 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 all behind the scenes going. Oh yeah, this is this is a hundred percent. That's why there's only like thirty of us. And one to put one rumor down. No, it was not all fucking high follower count influencers at all. There were actual journalists. There were YouTubers. There were people critical of Wizards of the Coast during the old OGL thing. There were people like me. Look, I may have a large following on Twitter, but like 2% of that is fucking TTRPG related. Yeah. My engagement in the <clears throat> online role-playing game world is subnominal. Is I am virtually insignificant. Streams I'm on get 10 viewers, 8, 2. That's the thing. I'm not on a whole lot. I don't even have my own Twitch channel. All of those followers came from an entirely different thing that was like six, seven fucking years ago. So I'm I'm an unknown factor in that. We had the gamut of people from people who have worked with wizards in the past to people who were critical of them like entirely. So there was no minimum follower count or any bullshit like that. To know we were not paid under a table. Flights were comped, which is standard. Flights Hotel is a standard thing for any uh, uh, any summit or symposium that is a small thing. That That is a standard across the industries from electronic. I've been flown out and hotels booked to, to go to a museum for a preparators summit like the, this is a normal thing mm -hmm. if you are invited to a product release and all of that and your flight and hotel are not provided they don't give a shit about you yeah right I, you know and just 
he, I, I'm weary about saying both sides, but just just to be completely transparent, was there some salt that I didn't get invited to go to the physical? Yeah, absolutely. Like, and I understand people that were salty about not being invited. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. But it was like because it was limited. Oh, and no, it was they weren't throwing out this fucking six seven figure thing. We figured it out. The entire deal, including so like if it was six figures, we would have been staying at like the Four Seasons fucking downtown Seattle and going for lobster dinners and shit like that. No, we calculated it. It was maybe sixty five grand total. Yeah, including flights per diems and all that. Yeah, I got two books, and so I got a copy of the Radiant Citadel, a uh, copy of uh, 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 the Vault Golden Key thing, and the box of Yawning Portal. Mm. That that that's it. Some people right. some people picked up chocolate bars or mag. I didn't even see the magnetic poetry. So like like that that was the swag. That's it. And, and I and again, thank you for talking about this because this is this is for me. That was the thing where I was like, I I'm probably gonna need to take a step away from Twitter because the whole thing got messy. Oh yeah, I understand people being salty. I was salty, but I don't think that that should. I don't think that that should be the fuel that you use to go after other creators right. again my eye was always on watsi i'm like watsi's the one that made me feel salty mm -hmm. we have had months of missteps from watsi yep. and some people that i'm friends with and that i care about are going there i want them to be safe right i you know oh, yeah I, is, I got that from your tweet yeah. i fucking got it yeah, but I this did see a company that by, over yeah. yeah. This is a company that like has had many cultural oversteps. And like if you see your friends walking into a place that can have such obvious oversight, you want them to be safe. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and, absolutely. And the people that were co-opting the argument did not give a shit about y'all safety. <laughs> <laughs> no, some 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 people that were physically going, I'm not going to name names on who it was or who did it. We're getting fucking death threats. Yeah. Yeah. Like and like not not joking, not no, hyperbole, no. not exaggerating. Literal death threats posted them. Posted images of them. I am apparently blocked by an entire section of the community because I dared question a person who was dumping vitriol about, you know, they were an independent game maker. I'm like, look, I understand your anger. I have the same level of anger, but I am trying to change shit because as we saw, there is a division in wizards of the coast where a large part of the community facing people, developers and programmers and artists and all of that, have our concepts, our ideas, and our wishes in mind and want to change. Then you have the executive. That is, D&D is under monetized. We need to do this. We need to do that. Uh, it's like, no, we want them to learn more about the VTT. That, that was all marketing bullshit. That is why all, like, the community managers, the forum managers people that were directly involved in the community and all that, they were, they all spoke up at the fucking meeting when we decided to go, we've had enough. And Nala to her, to their credit, just stepped up and went, why the fuck are we here? Like Connie G is like, it was a one, two punch. And then, then the floodgates came out. And then like Dr. B was talking, Jen Kretschmer was talking, Tanya, just like everything was fucking going on. And yeah. it was, it was rad, but yeah. we saw the division and we know where the division is and we know where we can exploit it now. So I truly believe in the, in the TTRPG space, mm -hmm. what really, so what really divides us is that there is a half that is focused on progress. And these are people that I tend to gel with a little bit better, which is just like, <laughs> 
we understand that this thing is broken to an extent and we want to fix it. Right. And then there is, there's the side of TTRPG Twitter that's focused on punishment, which yeah. is you've done, you've done something that offends me and I want you to burn in hellfire for it or yeah. like, and I, I, to some extent, this is valid. There, there are, there are personalities in the space. There are CEOs and companies that have escaped accountability and continue yep. to do so. And that is a problem. There are channels, there are streaming networks that are like, there's, there's a lot of those. Yes. And the desire to have these people held accountable, especially, you know, today we're seeing politicians, celebrities getting away with all sorts of bullshit that we know that they did, but by <laughs> means of power, they are able to avoid accountability. And so, yeah. it, you know, I, I understand not here, not this space. This is the line. I think I it, get that. I think it might be, it might be that, um, they're conflating the values of vengeance with the values of justice. Yes. Absolutely. I, I think that's nail on the head. So we yeah. there's progress and there's punishment. And I believe that the progress folks are a, are of the mindset of let's fix this thing and we can we can then turn our attention to holding holding folks and entities accountable. But more important than any one person facing accountability, we have to fix this thing that right. we all love and care for. It's the reason that we're here. Right. Because fixing the thing also reveals those who don't want it to be fixed and who should face criticism and yeah. justice and all of that. That's, that's another key point. One, the problem needs to be solved. Two, that includes pulling back the rug and finding all the bugs. Yes. Because if we pull and, ro and roll up that rug and go, this rug sucks, we need a better one that ties the room together. Then all of a sudden it's like, <laughs> fuck that, we need to fumigate and then put the cool rug back down. Yes. That, that's, that's, what I, that, that's my concept of what I'm trying to do in space. Yeah. And leave leaving toxic and poisonous platforms. You know, you know, not not trusting massive things. And before anybody in fucking chat who's watching this not in chat or who watches the VOD, look at these fucking jerseys. Yes, I am the creative director for the Watsy They're line really of nice. jerseys. <laughs> the thing is, Geeky Jerseys has an open Hasbro license. They've had that license for years. Any sort of revenue or anything like that has been long paid to the company years ago. Mm -hmm. Wizards of the Coast didn't get a fucking dime off any of the D&D or Magic the Gathering jerseys. And none of the G.I. Joe nor Transformers jerseys that are coming out either. So no, your jersey purchases of these these license go 100 percent to a small business run out of fucking canada so i don't want to hear it when you go you're a watsy show because you have the ampersand on your chest it's like fuck you i made this for my friend's business because he asked me to help design these i don't even get a cut of the jersey sales <laughs> i don't even get a cut so don't come at me with this. I'm a fucking wizard shill bullshit because I'm wearing an ampersand on my chest. I, I think, will fuck you up. I think I've made it clear my feelings on Watsy. Uh, oh, I yeah. Hate, I hate Watsy with a fucking passion. And I, I am I, I have no problem wearing the ampersand on the hat or on the jersey license. <laughs> And here's why. I hate what Watsy does. Mm -hmm. I love what Watsy makes. Yes. Watsy yes. yes. makes Watsy makes a product 
that quite literally saved my life. I've I've told the story of a thousand times. I'm not gonna tell it again. But I was oh no no no. A, I've you, you've told me the story. Yeah, I was living in a crack den. I I rediscovered my love of TTRPGs. I've rediscovered my love of storytelling, and I'm here with friends that I would never have made, with a partner I would never have found, with a job that I never would have gotten into if my love of telling stories with folks didn't give me the courage to quit a job that was quite literally killing me. Right. That That's what this means to me. It does not mean Watsy. Exactly. It, it, I, I love that the logo is and. It, it's the ampersand thing. It's and. That's the thing. Because it's just like, it, it by its very nature, the ampersand is inclusive. It's joining. And to me, that's what this hobby is about. It's about joining. It's about, I don't know your life, but I know my character and I know your character. And that is the bridge in which I can learn who you are and we can become friends. Right. That's why it's, it, it's always been, well, I mean, just l look at the term role playing game. You're playing a role. You were telling a story while playing a game, role-playing game. And yes, it is the world's greatest role-playing game. It's been around for almost 50 fucking years. It, and I agree that the ampersand is, well, it's like the DM style. Yes. And yes. it's yes. Ampersand. And then whatever the player wants to do, they can always give whatever the fuck they want a shot. In, in a home game, I had, last night, I had a player want to cast a touch, a touch spell for healing. He wanted to, uh, no, was it Lirhana? It was Lirhana. She wanted to touch the big black great worm dragon that was stepping on the ranger and wanted it to transfer, transfer through the dragon to where the ranger was was being contacted by the skin. I'm like, fuck it. Make, 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 give me a melee attack, a, me a melee spell attack roll. If you hit, if you hit, it'll transfer missed, but I was going to allow it. I'm like, fuck yeah, let's do this. I'm totally going to let that happen because that is cool. That's part of the story. Yes. That's part of the role playing. I wasn't talking to a biological scientist who is a uh, fucking teacher. I was talking to Lirhana the wizard artificer gnome who is going through a crisis right now and on, on her villain arc because of the horrors that she has seen in this world. And I'm not talking to a PhD in optics who works for fucking NASA and shit like that. It's an elven ranger gloom stalker <laughs> from the underdark who's being pressed down by a big fucking imaginary flying lizard with magic. I mean, come <laughs> on. It is a collaborative storytelling experience. It is a role playing game. You're playing a role. Whether it's, I, yeah, it, it, it's just, and that that's what drives me to it. And that's what it's always driven me is the yes. And it is that you're right. It's the fucking ampersand. It's yeah. not dungeons or dragons. It's not tunnels or trolls. It's not DMS or players. Dungeons and Dragon. It's and a I, thing and another thing. And I had somebody ask me a question about this jersey because they knew how I felt about wizards. And they're like, how can you wear that if you hate wizards? There is a Captain America panel that really comes to mind when I put this on. Mm -hmm. Where somebody asked Cap, like, America is fucking horrible. Why would you wear that flag? And the answer was simple. I don't wear this for what America is. I wear this for what it should be. Yep. And I, I as long panel. as as long as I do what's right, then I'm working on making this thing what I believe it can be. Right. I hate what Wizards is. I fully believe in what it can be. Yeah. But in order for it to be that, we have to change it. 
Yes. My way of changing it is I am going to stay on Wizards' neck until they do right by us. Yeah. I am going to use any and every platform I get to go. This is where they fucked up. Don't fuck up like this again. Right. Absolutely. That that's that's the right way to do it. But calling open warfare against people that play it, that enjoy it, that that's that's the wrong way to do it. You're attacking the wrong people. Yeah, they're not making the decisions. Yeah, exactly. Know? The 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 community managers are not making the decisions. The guest relations people are not. The programmers are not. The writers are not. The art directors are not, with the exception of the Hadazi, but we won't get into that. <laughs> um because that was just like what the fuck that was but a that was done fuck. that was done prior to dei approval now all that has changed hard and then all of that however you know they're they're the ones i am working with to change shit because wizards management wizards executives are reporting to a much larger company. Yeah, Hasbro. Yeah, it's that company that is doing really fucked up things. And by the way, they're doing a lot of really fucked up things with a lot of really fucked up lines. So I don't know why everybody is focusing on Wizards of the Coast because you should be talking about the fucking Transformers line because holy shit, are they fucking that pig. I don't like, even that that's more Nita's bag than mine. <laughs> it's like, oh my fucking God. Um it's like there there are so many things that they're that that the parent company is doing wrong, and unfortunately shit rolls downhill. So do executives. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because higher executives want to bring on sip, you know, uh sycophantic lower executives that don't know what's going on. And then they want to bring their team and so on and so on, leading the creatives and the forum directors and the artists and the writers and all of that in a continual tailspin of this cool thing is rad. You're like, you don't have the budget for that, but, but people will like it and it's transformative and, and it's awesome. It's like, you don't have the budget for that or we're not going to allow that. Or that's too close to the old shit that we don't to legacy stuff that we don't want to we don't want to work with anymore. And it's like we have fifty years of an IP. What do you mean you don't want to work on it anymore? It, it's like, yeah, there's there is a sharp division between the creatives who are responsible for the game and the people that are unfortunately telling the creatives what to do. And how to do it and how much money they have. I, and I, it sucks. And right now what's really frustrating is if ever there was a time to voice reasonable dissent, it's now. Yep. What Re Hasbro is seeing the cash cow that Dungeons and Dragons is, yeah. and they want to feed on it. Yeah. Right because now, if we were organized. To... Oh, yeah. That, you're right. Yeah. If we were organized yeah. and reasonable, we could make such positive, monumental change. And I'm not saying reasonable and positive in such a way where you have to suck Watsi's dick. I'm saying the opposite. I'm saying instead of attacking each other with the vitriol that we have in these last couple of months, if we did what we did when the OGL came out, where we all were a united front and we went, we don't like this. Yeah. There were still some toxic elements to that. I'm not going to... There is a lot of it, toxic it, elements. It to turned. That. It turned with a hey, we don't like this to a outrage farming whirlwind of shit with who knows how many falsehoods being taken as fact. See, in the beginning, in the beginning, before the opportunist hopped it on though. Oh, you mean you mean back when it, uh, back when the leak happened and everybody knew they were NDAs and not contracts? Yeah, yeah, that would have been nice to stay with those. 
Then the yeah. NDAs turned into contracts and then they turned into whatever the fuck else. And then there was the whole D and D beyond is going to be twenty nine ninety nine a month and no homebrew and shit like that. Yeah. And, and all this stuff, it's like, Oh, how can it be a leak? If it has language like January 13th in it, it's like, cause that's a date placeholder because they got the fucking OGL and the NDAs in, in, in November, October, November. Yeah. And then they had a supplement written in December. Yes. It really was a fucking leak. Like yeah. for real, it was a draft. It, it was not the real thing. This was a framework that they were working with larger, uh, larger people with the, those kinds of frameworks. And like, yes, it would have fucked the industry a hundred percent, but those types of open gaming licenses, it wasn't really, it was harkening back to the fourth edition shit, but those types of things are standard in other industries. Well, I, and I appreciate that, but there was, there was a moment where we had lawyers that were in this hobby. They were just like, let's yep. take a look at it. Yep. Let's let's take a, take a step back. We're going to take an academic look at it. We're going to use our skill in the trade of, you know, law to like see what the problems are. And then there were game designers that spoke up where it was like, well, now that you've broken it down, these are the particular threats to this right. aspect. And then we have VTT designers going, and these are the particular threats to this aspect of the space. That's right. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. No, that was productive. Yes. However, there was one or two lawyer account. I don't remember what because I don't follow them. I don't I don't get involved in the YouTube side of things or mm -hmm. anything like that. There were uh, somebody sent me links to two podcasts or YouTube videos or something like that, where two separate lawyers were reading through it and going, yeah, that's normal. That's normal. That's normal. That's to be expected. Yeah, that's totally fine. Yeah, this small part could be a fucking problem. That small part, you know, that kind of thing. They're like, yeah, this is standard boilerplate bullshit. I think I think we're talking about the same video. M maybe. Uh, uh, that I was Legal Kimchi. Uh, who is, Legal Kimchi is a TTRPG personality that kind of boils down the legal aspect of the space. Oh, th this wasn't a TTRPG person. This wasn't just a lawyer. Oh. Yeah. Okay. I know was, the video you're talking about. We're not talking about the same one. Yeah, no. Um, uh, it, it's like a literal um, uh, IP lawyer. That that, yeah. that that that's his job. Yeah. And he was just like, "Yep, yeah, problem, problem, problem." Yeah. And no one took that. No one took that seriously, and it was buried in the outrage form. See, the outrage came later to me, but that yeah. might just be my feed. Um, I've, I've blocked a lot of people. Yeah, no. Um, <laughs> so I. I, I block extremely few people. I like mute because I like, I like the fact that one, they don't get the jollies off. <laughs> he blocked me. Um, but also it's the go ahead, scream into the void. I'm never <laughs> going to see it. <laughs> no, I, I, I want them to know. I don't care anymore. <laughs> oh, but I, I, I want them to think that I care. <laughs> while I just go, what? No, I'm sorry. My my monitor's not working. What? <laughs> but it showed the capacity for this space to do productive work in changing something that we don't like. Oh, yeah, for a hot second. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just like, we have the capacity. I just saw it. And then it Click spiraled hungry. and spiraled and spiraled into a shit fest. And I'm just like, we just showed that we have the capacity as a space to look at something reasonably, to dissect and find what needs to be changed and to pitch that change right. without killing each other. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And, 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 and we had we had two examples. We had the positive, like let's dissect this and find what we don't like. And then we had again progress. And then punishment. And right. punishment was like, fuck this, fuck you, fuck everybody. Like it is just like 
I get right. it. I I do get it. Mm-hmm. And I share some of those sentiments and like you'll even see on Twitter I'm like, yeah, I get that. But not at the cost of destroying people that are just trying to do the damn thing, you know? Right. Yeah. Right. And and yeah, there were parts of it that were problematic that people that people thought would impact them, but who actually fell under the 2017 fan content policy um, that has been fine ever since. Like, I don't know why people started arguing about that since that's been in place for years and you've all been using it. um, or We've all been using it and never complained, but it was like, yeah, when, when those, when those, when the actual lawyers, the legal experts were picking it apart and going, okay, well, from our estimates, it would affect maybe, 1% of the top earning people. And that's it. And yeah, I get that that is scary to some people because everybody wants to be that. I'm going to fucking hate to say it. There is no, okay. One, there is no Matt Mercer effect. That, that is a flat out lie. Wrong. There hmm. is that Mercer effect. Would you like to know what it is? Uh, it's that everybody wants to be critical role. No, we 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 we, I, we had Mercer on. Oh, I know. And, oh, I know. And, we, and we, we've decided to change the Mercer effect. The Mercer effect is now the desire to wear long vest. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. No. Very true. Um, it, it's like um, uh, what is it? Kill him and loot his, and loot his corpse. Take his vest. Take his vest. Uh, yeah. Um, it's the source of his power. <laughs> the uh he did uh he he uh, a long time ago there was a um uh like behind the screen or whatever the fuck they called it where they interviewed every specific people well, between uh, every, the sheets. every person thank you between the sheets and matt said that the vests are his armor they're his comfort yeah. he yeah. wears them because he has you know body dysmorphia or or something along those lines that's why i wear fucking jerseys i used to play hockey this to me is comfort. But when I put on a Maple Leafs jersey, that is my that is me honoring my favorite team. When I put on something like this, I'm putting up the fucking flag. I'm walking through Dragon Con going, check it out. I'm a fucking dungeon master. Let's bring it. Yeah. Or or like I like yes, I have a Jurassic Park jersey, but that's cuz paleontology. And <laughs> I get to use that. People are like, oh, hey, Jurassic Park. I'm like, I'm a paleontologist. It sucked. Um, it, it's kind of like a give and take. But like Back to the Future is my favorite movie. It's like, sorry, folks that like like Star Wars. Back to the Future is a stronger trilogy. 100% without a doubt. I like Star Wars. BTTF, way better. It also takes place uh, entirely around my uh, like my birthday week. Um, which is cool. And when I was a kid, I'm like, fuck, oh, right on. Do I get a time machine? No. I want a DeLorean, no. But it's like, I, I put up the flag. So I 100% what he gets. It's like, yes, the Mercer effect is wearing vests. The slightly less known Mercer effect would be wearing something comfortable that you desire and you like and you are proud to do it. Whether it's pride cloth, stickers, have your hair a certain way fucking ampersand hat a negative two hat whatever the fuck makes you feel like fuck yeah that yeah you're right that is the mercer effect i guess what i was going for was the version of the mercer effect that everybody wants to be that dm it's like nah, that's not true but what it actually is is that everybody wants to be critical role everybody wants to be not everybody but a lot of people want to be critical role dimension 20 um rivals um uh, you know all all that you know everything uh, uh bds uh motherland all of that they want to have massive kickstarters and everything they want to get to the point where that original ogl would start impacting them after seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars, they would they would they would owe wizards of the coast a quarter like a, a physical quarter they want to get to that part and i applaud them and I love them for trying, but it's probably not going to happen. 
And I understand that people get mad about it. Yeah. But but you 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 have to you have to face the reality every once in a while. It's like do your goddamn best. I am never going to be the best paleontologist. Never going to be the best hockey player. I'm never going to be, you know, the the best anything. Because there because the moment you humble yourself and realize there are a lot better people out there that do a lot better things than yeah, that's that's a great way to do it. Well, so I th- I think a lot of people were doing that like this will impact my future. It, it, it just to kind of hop on that if I may. What bothers me about that particular version of the Mercer effect which uh, the critical you'll, role effect. Let's say yeah, the, the critical role effect. The people that want that don't want to put in the work. And here's what I mean by that: if yes. you if you want to accomplish something, the best way to accomplish anything is to figure out how the thing that you want to accomplish happened. Right. The first time I went to LA, it was a discovery mission. I want to make a production studio in Chicago because as much as I love my friends in LA, as much as I love going to LA, I love, I love Chicago. It's my home. So like, how did they do that over there? So the first time I went to LA, uh, I, we, I've visited hyperdrive studios. I had to talk with them about how they set things up. I had to talk with Brennan about like, how d20 happened uh when we had mercer on here i asked a bunch of questions about critical role and i talked to a bunch of folks in the geek and century side of things about at the start how did y'all do it right because of course everybody in, in, in accordance to the critical role effect everybody wants that success yeah absolutely i don't expect to have that success but i want to do the research and figuring out how it happened and how I can emulate it. The thing that a lot of people don't understand about Critical Role is that you cannot replicate what happened with Critical Role. You need to understand they started with a bunch of voice actors who already had their own fan base. They started on Geek and Sundry, which was funded by Legendary Studios. Which was a part of Nerdist. Which was a part of Nerdist. So they they had budget behind them to begin with yes they had funding that you will listen if you're starting a channel you will never have the funding that critical role did in the beginning right and third critical role started when twitch was new when twitch didn't even know what twitch was right and so there was a deal in which critical role would remain on the front page for weeks at a time and anybody that does anything on Twitch understands the benefit of being on the front page. Right. So you have an established fan base, you have your budget taken care of, and you have a, a miracle deal, a miracle deal, which Twitch would never give anybody ever again, because okay. now they understand their worth partially because of Critical Role. Mm-hmm. You're not going to replicate that. So then the next question is, how do I replicate Dimension 20? Well, let's take a look at how Dimension 20 started. Dimension 20 started college at, humor. The, at the tail end of college humor. Again, they had the funding. Yep. <laughs> they had a pre-established base with their personalities. And they had funding from Dropout because Dropout was happening before yep. criti- before Dimension, uh, uh, college humor went under. And also look at everybody in d20 or on dropout brennan and lou have a long standing like hardcore Im- uh, improv duo and background uh siobhan does izzy does fucking every single person on there is either an uh professional actor improv comedian sketch writer stuff like that it's it's basically it's having the classical saturday night live cast on a show exactly they don't hate each other these are it's it's the difference between 
It's between the Sex Pistols and the Monkees. The Sex, both of them were engineered bands. The Sex Pistols got really, really huge, but they never left the garage. That would be, that would be the streamer that doesn't look for what is uh, how to do it within their means, like you were talking about. The Monkees were an engineered band that knew how to play the game. And ended up outselling the Beatles, which and is fucking ex- mind-boggling. Yeah, I, first off, I didn't know that. That's really yeah. cool to find out. Oh yeah, out. no, yeah, the monkey, the monkeys did that. But then, of course, there was infighting, and they fucking fell apart. Right. Um, and you know, there, everything does that. Um, also, uh, like, uh, ye horrible uh, wood company, um, <laughs> the, the 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 wood of worms, they did the same. Thing. They had strong backing. They started putting out products. They put out a huge Kickstarter. And then it turns out, oh, they're the fucking milkshake duck. They got milkshake duck they're, real hard. They major. And yeah, that happens. Also, the two who are not named in the space anymore did the same thing. You come from a background, you become famous, you meet, you meet a visual goal. The salty bird. And yes. Then, yes. And then it, it's that, you know, you become the, you know, insert trope here, whether it's the, you know, the sexy voiceover actor or the e-girl or whatever you embrace that you become popular. And then it's like Kickstarter and this and that, and everything's cool. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, milkshake duck. Uh, it's it's that kind of thing. So one, if you're looking to do that, like like you said, ask questions, research it, and then figure out, okay, they all had major funding. How do I secure major funding? Or how can I do it in my means? All of that. Also, make sure you're not an asshole. <laughs> Or yeah, you're some, not going to get far if you're a dickhead. Yeah, or some fucked up thing because I don't know how many people know, but there there's a bunch of back channel shit in the oh. tabletop role playing space where we all know shit before it starts getting posted on Twitter. Yeah. And yeah. we're already bracing for it. So yeah. <laughs> I mean, don't don't be an asshole. Don't fuck up. If you do <laughs> fuck up, immediately go like honest apology. Own it. Own it. Yeah. Own it. <laughs> and and don't put a coupon code for your merch in your apology. <laughs> I couldn't believe that. Yeah. The, the thing. So so here's the thing. I I had a fuck up that I didn't realize was a fuck up until about a week or two after it happened. Uh, what is it? Yeah. So it's seven words. I was on the Joe Rogan show or podcast, whatever you want to say, went on there twice. The first time I went on because my publicist at Nat Geo at the time, I was having a documentary coming out about my expedition to Siberia he saw the press release and went, hey, I've never had a paleontologist on before. And I was on there for an hour, talked about my documentary, went off and did the fucking interview circuit thing. Like, like nothing weird, stupid, conspiracy, anything like that. Two years later, uh, I got an email saying, hey, do you want to come on? There's this dude online with videos saying dinosaurs never existed. So I didn't do the proper thought process of, okay, how do I do this? How do I enter into this debate? How do I, 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 you know how we were talking about progress judgment? Yeah. I went judgment immediately, (laughs) but it wasn't judgment. Like he's wrong and he must pay. It was fuck this dude. (laughs) I am going to go on there and I'm going to have a few beers and I'm going to scream bullshit for three hours because I thought I could fucking change the world and him and everybody that watched the show. 
And that was a stupid fucking thing that I did because it immediately got me followed by so much of the under the ground bar fucking it's it's like bald bearded oh god i'm trying i'm trying to <laughs> i'm trying to say a word that's not ableist um uh, dickheads dipshits <laughs> dipshit tom fuckery spewing sycophantic fucking toadies ass lickers in a bad way not in a good way you know boot licking pieces of shit that inhabit that space and the moment in the podcast where i'm like by the way white privilege is real the hate mail the show wasn't even over and the hate mail started pouring in and then all the conspiracists started pouring in i got shit for months both good and bad and about six months later i'm like that was a really fucking stupid position that was a stupid thing for me to do I was hammered. I fucked up. I said dumb shit that wasn't right. I fucked up the two names of two of the most prominent paleontologists in paleontological history. And I fucked up their names because I was drunk. And I did a big thing on, okay, this is where I went wrong. These are the wrong things I said. This is everything wrong that happened. I was a fucking idiot. I shouldn't have done this. I've embarrassed myself, my profession, my professional contacts, and everything. I owned it 100%. Yes. People still to this day come up to me, hey, were you that dude on the Joe Rogan program? I'm like, yeah, I was. Like, I'm glad you enjoyed it, but it was one of the worst things I've ever done. (laughs) Every single time, I apologize for it. And if I'm feeling particularly salty, I'm like, yeah, I fucking hated it. And the show is trash because the show is trash. Um, you know, in my personal opinion, if I may, Mm -hmm. if this is, this, (laughs) I'm I'm navigating this cautiously. It's Um, it's coming around. (laughs) Uh, for the longest time, not any longer, but I, I need to stress that. But for the longest time, I was a fan of Joe Rogan, mainly because, again, remember, I come from the world of stand up. Oh, 100%. Absolutely. And, and, and in that world, he was a hero long before the podcast, mainly because of his interaction with Carlos Mencia. Yes. Calling out joke thieves because nobody else stepped up to do that. Like, I. Right. Like, and that, that was a huge motivation for me where if something is wrong, you should say something because if you don't, people will get away with it. Right. Um, Absolutely. I don't like the Joe Rogan podcast, but many people that I respect have been on there. Well, not many people, but uh, one of my favorites is Adam Conover. I am a huge Adam, Adam Conover fan. Oh, he, um, he's he's a riot. Yeah, he's, he's fucking amazing. I love Adam Ruins Everything. So like I, that that is an episode of that podcast that I did uh, quite enjoy, uh, mainly because Joe Rogan has so many problematic transphobic views, and it was nice to see somebody come on the show and go, "Ha ha, no." Exactly. <laughs> exactly. There are there are the occasional things that put him back on his heels, but then the next five guests are. Hardcore alt right uh, Jordan Peterson's oh, in oh here. God. Um Milo. <laughs> um you Oh know, god, alt- I hate that man so fucking much. Oh. <laughs> Don't get me started. Um let's you know, let's sh- the other let's the Shapiro. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Um, you know, people that you know that are like, you know, you know, facts aren't feelings. It's like, well, you're uh, you're getting really worked up about this, so well. Um <laughs> it's it's like hypocrites and and yes and it is an absolute platform that people that of an uncouth separatist non-progressive concept tune into and before i get into the whole politics thing i am an independent registered independent voter i go i go the way 
of how I think things would benefit society. I have voted on both sides of the aisle. I have voted for both sides of the aisle with people. I, I, because I am not going to contribute pretty much anything to society, but I hope that my votes will. That's how I look at it. I am not a centrist at all. I am, I am a, I am a community minded person. So yes, I will be fucking judgmental, judgmental about both sides. Um, (laughs) Cause God damn, everyone's fucking up. But um, the fact that it is a platform, not it doesn't matter if the host believes in it or not. The fact that he's giving a microphone to people that are divisive, that yeah. say things that want to literally incite violence against others, and the, the fact that it's an absolute lie of, oh, we just want to hear both sides. Oh, we just want to ask questions. No. There is no both sides when people are white supremacists. There are no both sides when people are misogynists. You can't there both no, sides fascism. No, you cannot both sides fascism. You cannot both sides intolerance. There, Yes, I won't get into the whole Karl Popper tolerance and tolerance and toler- tolerance and parado- uh, paradox of tolerance and all of that. But there is a point that a line has to be drawn. As a Jew, I draw that line really fucking deep. Yeah. And the fact that numerous guests on that show have made numerous statements, not necessarily on the show, because they get softballs pitched to them, but have said and believe things. I do not want those people to have a platform. Yes. Call me, say that censorship, go right the fuck ahead. But inciting saying that a section of people in the world are responsible for who knows what kind of conspiracy theory and they should be exterminated is not topics that should, or that should be platformed. Period. Yeah. That would like me being me saying X people, you know, I don't like X people because they're not white. They should be killed. Why the fuck would you have me on your show to say that? Yeah. Or if I said that, why would you have me on your show to, to even talk to me while that is floating around in the ether right on the outside of it, because I said it last week at a fucking convention. I mean, if you have a platform, you have to protect it. You have to safeguard it because yep. you're responsible for what you allow to come out into the world. That is why there are some people that will never be on this show. And there are some people that will never be invited back to this show. It's just. Exactly. You know, and when you get a $200 million deal, Fuck it. There's some people that will literally go, well, that mechanic works. I'm going to keep doing it. Yeah. (laughs) Come on, man. It's it's the same thing. Opportunists exist because it works. Like, unfortunately, it it fucking works. Like, and that's why I had to step back at Twitter because rage farming, rage farming can become an addiction. It can become oh, yeah. an addiction to get upset. And There's an entire section of the uh, indie RPG uh, space that has been mass blocking and dogpiling on me behind the scenes because I was on the Joe Rogan podcast. And, and because I wear an ampersand. And because I called out outrage farmers. Yeah. So I'm immediately a racist shill white supremacist because I'm for some reason supporting the big man against the little man. And I was on a podcast that I've been disavowing for seven fucking years. I I wish people would understand that most things in life exist on a spectrum and going too far in either direction on a spectrum can talk about everything's black and white there is no gray there is only right and wrong 
No, no. Know, going going too far on either side of the spectrum is always it can always lead to a problem. Like you know oh, shit. <laughs> I just I just realized what mug I was drinking from and which way it was facing the camera. Oh god, what now you have to let us know. <laughs> and this happens every once in a while. I have I have three mugs. My really, really good friends, Diana D'Amico and Justice Hughes, have a company called Barton Bards Barbarian. Barbarian. They're fucking amazing. They have they have the occasional switch uh, Twitch channel. A long time ago, they did a Call of Cthulhu game called Iron Dust and Blood, and it came up that so it came up the Gatlin horse. It is mounting a Gatlin gun on the horse <laughs> because it was an old West style Call of Cthulhu game. It's yeah. brilliant. One mug is red and black, and like, I just grab mugs, pour tea in it, and sit down. One mug is red and black, has says Bard and Barbarian on it, has their logo on the ends. One of them is the Gatlin horse, and on the other side is the slogan, Tits, Guns, and Dynamite. I love yes! it. Yes! <laughs> and, and I never fucking remember until I look up in the camera, because I'm facing the camera right now. My monitors are way up here, so I'm trying to engage by right. looking at the camera and listening. So then I'm just drinking tea, and then I look at my monitor. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> Listen, we love titties. We love guns. And we love dynamite. Dynamite. I mean, why not? I mean, it's – I've and I've told Diana that numerous times. I'm like, I TGD'd the fucking stream again. She's like, thank you for selling our products. I'm like, it's just <laughs> – Okay, I should specify I like guns in my RPGs and yes. nowhere else. Um, um, but yeah, hell yeah. So yeah, we've been at this for about two over two hours now. Uh, I we've got a couple questions that we have to hit every. That's true. With. That's true. Uh, so uh, Noir, you want to take it away? Speaking of, has it been uh, really be two hours? It has been yeah. two hours and ten minutes. Uh, I, speaking of how uh, being on either one side of the issue or another side of the issue is a bad thing. Noir. <laughs> this is a case in which things are black and white. <laughs> and there is no spectrum number by what I said five minutes ago. <laughs> There's a war in the TTRPG space between those of us who see these as tools to tell a story and nothing further. And then there are those of us. I already know my answer to this, dude. Don't do this. Then there are those of us who see the master for Ben Oh, no! <laughs> the third no! For <laughs> Why is this happening? No! <laughs> Shit! God mm, damn it. Love, lovely. And the thing is, there's Make different mouthfeel. <laughs> yeah, there's different mouthfeel between large metal ones, small metal ones, and acrylic. No! There's different mouth mouthfeel with resin. There's no resin's um, poisonous. Don't put it in your mouth. But I mean, yeah, but it's just like if you're just in it. But yeah, they they make candy dice because they're crunchable. So no, I am 100. percent And we fucking got into it. And I do believe, I do believe mm -hmm, that there is go. a picture of you with a very large. I think it was a D12 in your mouth as we convinced you, at least for one night. You are a team crunch. First off, I, there needs to be several disclaimers. One, I was very drunk. <laughs> oh no, we were fucked up. <laughs> Shout out to Scum and Villainy Cantina in Hollywood. Oh, they always bring it. <laughs> Two, that was a plush dice, not a real one. And oh yeah oh yeah all right yeah, yeah. The, the whole dice are dirty thing that was a plush foam die in a bar <laughs> but i one i couldn't damage my teeth with it and two it wasn't a choking hazard because i couldn't choke on it okay which are, which, which are my two main reasons for not crotching so because you can't truly crotch that die i don't think it counts so you are the third guest to bring this up. This is the third out of guest how many? Wow! <laughs> that what, picture you, you, you is eating notorious the at this at this point. <laughs> okay, so to curb my my dice crunching, one 
because I am also immunocompromised, I am ridiculously just habitual about cleaning my dice. I clean them. They are they are in a sanitized tray. And I clean them after every game. Because me. Two, to I, prevent I believe you. I believe you. I don't believe most people who crunch dice. To believe to to stop my crunching. I am also in the camp of noted dungeon master of Dimension 20, Brennan Lee Mulligan. That snacking during games are essential. Absolutely. <laughs> True. Again, his statement of if I had an open hole in my back for someone to shovel things into to fuel this burning furnace of a body, 100%. <laughs> I would hire somebody to do that at way above minimum wage. <laughs> a minimum of twice minimum wage. Three. That is why I won snack two embrace my old you know old fartness were there's candies yes all oh, where candies are the goat and i refuse to acknowledge, i refuse to acknowledge anybody that doesn't accept that werther's are the fucking bomb i will always have werther's werther's or black licorice so i'm on both sides of the spectrum on that if but, you take a bunch of werther's and you put them in a vodka bottle and you just let them sit there it's so good if you put Werther's in your hot tea. Ooh, I gotta try that. It's delicious. But that prevents me from crunching dice because I am also a fidgeter. I am on the spectrum. I always have things to mess with, little fidgets here and there. Yeah, I that's was. What, um, that's why I have my sonic screwdriver close to me now. It's my favorite fidget. Um, <laughs> spe speaking of, you know, being a shill for Watsy. Because of my disabilities and to test them, uh, I was sent the disability kit, the 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 D and the D &D for all kit, which was a stupid way, but the disability the accessibility testing kit that was designed by uh, Dixon and Jen, because I have issues with um, with matching contrast, dark mode for life, yeah. also fidgets. And the way things go together and everything like that. I want things to be clean and easy and all of that. So I was I was given one of those to test. It had fidgets in it. Like like actual like at things things. So you're like behind the screen going, okay, yeah, this is what happens when the dragon all the time your hands are doing like that. I constantly fidget with my dice. And if I do not have something in my mouth. While I'm talking, it could be a toothpick, it could be a Werther's candy, it could be something. I will stick a die in my mouth. <laughs> I will probably do it off camera or below the screen like, okay, what did I... Um, <laughs> just out of habit because I have to have something rolling around in my mouth. And I can speak eloquently and fluently and all of that. Like It doesn't sound like I have a Werther's in my mouth right now. But it's tucked between my teeth and my cheek. And then I roll it around and everything's fine. I can even clamp it between my teeth and it's only a slight impact because I just, I need to be doing something separate or I don't know what I'm doing with my hands because I gesture with my hands when I talk this way. I could be a bit more narrative. And so like I've been switching between Werther's or a toothpick. The thing about the toothpick is that, it hides in my beard and you can't really see it all that yeah like okay that. i i so hate yes, that I'm, you're making I am me team do crunch. this i am team crunch i am going to i am going to make an exception you you are part of a group that i that i am creating here and now that i will accept because i believe that you actually sanitize your dice it's still a choking hazard which oh, yeah. I don't love, and it can still damage your teeth, which I don't love. I don't necessarily, well, okay, no, that's not true. I do bite down on <laughs> But here's the name of your group. But but I also have squishy dice to do that. I have okay. silicone silicone squishy dice. Oh, I got those too, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, so. All right, ah. here's the name of the group. I'm not sure if this is ableist, so please, if it is, correct me. 
But I will name your group because I believe that you do clean your die. Immuno crotch for my for my. I like it. Castle. No, I like it. <laughs> they are A the really only exceptions. When the war starts, we will not touch the immuno crotch premise. But the rest of you motherfuckers, it's war. <laughs> so yeah, like so, but that mm, that should also include you know the the you know um, the spectrum of people that require fidgets and things like that. So perhaps the. <laughs> the immuno crotch provides spectrum or the uh the the, mm, the crancho divergent oh <laughs> crancho divergent i like that one mm, yeah. I like divergent. It. all right we'll allow it yep. when the war so starts we'll, when the war starts we will be switzerland you <laughs> will be switzerland but not not in a bad um we don't like nazis or the other people way <laughs> um, but like actually to promote peace, but, uh, yeah, by the way, one of the greatest things, cause yes, there's soap and there's soap and water and soaking and all that. But I have found if you use a dilute, um, hydrogen peroxide solution. So as one part, uh, hydrogen peroxide, uh, like standard 3%, whatever the hell it is, uh, to five parts water as either a soak or a spray on a rag and wash them. That's what you do. You know what? We have these UV sanitizers they, for our phones. Why don't we have those for our dice? And any any source of UV sanitizing will work. A, a UV pen mm -hmm. held over them for a long enough time will kill bacteria, etc. The problem is you also have to sanitize the surface that True. they will be on, and also make sure that your hands are nice and clean. Personal hygiene comes into things, especially remember. All you con goers, please take Deodorant. a shower. Deodorant for the love of fucking God. Yep. Wash your hands. Wash your face. Wash your butt. If you're not going to take a shower, hands, face, lower sections, deodorant. Minimum. Please. please. At the very least, wash your pits. Yeah. Wash your pits. Some yeah. of y'all be killing me out there. <laughs> Dragon Con, dude. By Dragon Ooh. Con Saturday? Holy fuck. It's yeah. spicy. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yes, I am. I am Crancho Divergent. So, <laughs> um, yeah. What's what's the what's the next question? The next question is the punishment question for Crouchers, which is: <laughs> you get to play any game that you want with any five people. You are not included in the five. You get to choose the game and who's the GM. Who's at the table? Uh, extant or extinct? I.e., li uh, living and or dead. Only living. only living. Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> as soon as you say only, as soon as you put that one, you have that's where people are upset. Yeah, so it has to be okay. They have to be living. It can be any system. Uh -huh. Any system. Do I have to alive. name the system? Yep. Number one system is ten candles. Nice. Ooh. Fuck! I can't. <laughs> maybe, no, maybe ten candles wouldn't be. Um, actually, yeah, it would be Star Trek: The Role Playing Game. Oh hell Fantasy yeah! Fantasy Flight or uh, Star Trek Adventures or the or yeah the... yeah. Well, uh, honestly, either either Adventures or even the old school one. They uh, were all really good. Was it Lost Unicorn? Um, or Lost Unicorn was the publisher for that yeah. one. Um, pretty much any Star War, uh, Star Trek RPG. The let's see, the GM will be Todd Stashwick. Oh yeah. So that so I've got four four players to pick. Mm hmm. Okay. Jerry Ryan for the familiarity uh, yeah. between uh, and the 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 Star Trek Picard connection and all that because also Jerry Ryan is fucking rad. Terry Farrell, who played uh, Jedzia Dax on DS9, because also fucking rad. Justice for Jedzia. Yes. God, I'm I'm tossed between. Hmm. 
This is a solid table so far. Todd Stashwick, Cherry Ryan, and Terry. Okay, so. So we got our Voyager, our Picard, and our uh, DS9. DS9. God, this is a tough one, dude. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, uh, fuck. Uh, I got, I don't remember his name. Uh, Jake Sisko. Sir Ralph Lofton. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. One more. What? Wait, what? 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 You have a problem with Jake? Oh, no. I oh, no. I love Jake. Oh, I was just adjusting um, my chair. Oh, OK. Um, <laughs> shit. I only have I only have five more. I can't have I, I mean, I have four more. I, well, one more. I can't have two. I'll give you two. OK, because one absolutely would be Dr. Aaron McDonald, the uh, science advisor to all of Star Trek, one of my best friends. And she's in my home game. Um, oh, that's awesome! Shout out to Dr. Aaron Mack, uh, literal astrophysicist, um, uh, PhD in uh, gravity waves, like part of the LIGO project, that whole, whole deal. Wow. Tattooed, fucking pigeon. But, um, uh, who, who is it? Um, I have to look up their name quick. Um, uh, is it is it Lou Wilson? Um, I just forget their fucking name. Uh, shit. Um, give me one second. Um, God, uh, Aaron will be so mad at me. For not doing this. <laughs> she, she is also a character in uh star trek Pro prodigy by the way um oh. fun fact uh fun fact um uh dr Aaron mcdonald is one of two people to ever uh play themselves in star trek in star trek oh, uh cool. the other one is stephen hawking uh i played with uh bonnie gordon who's the computer on uh star trek Pirate prodigy Oh yeah, no, Bonnie's fantastic. Uh she's a very good friend of mine from the Magic Castle. Um yeah. she's awesome. I uh, want to go to the Magic Castle so bad. Next time you're in uh next time you're in LA, let's go. Fuck yeah. Um fuck, why am I not for Dex? Is it I don't remember. What is their name? Uh who do they play? I don't I it words escape. So okay. Since the stroke because of the brain cancer, I have wicked aphasia. So mm -hmm. putting names to faces fucks me up. Putting putting actors to characters fucks me up. It's just like I don't remember if they're prodigy disco, maybe disco. Oh, um, see, I'm naturally that way. I I suck with names so fucking bad. It's the worst. Because I know it's not Enterprise. It's not all of the previous ones. Uh, Blue Del Barrio. She plays Adria on fucking Discovery. Oh, there you go. Lou is is amazing. Sorry, I totally misgendered them. Uh, they play um uh, um Adria on on disco. Um oh. yeah, Adria Tal. They they are fucking phenomenal. We and they got they got the uh they got the opportunity to be the first non-binary actor to play a non-binary character. Yes. Oh. We we actually reached out to them to try to get them on this show. Like I I am a huge fan. Oh. Oh 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 okay. Aaron knows them. So uh let me talk to Aaron and see <laughs> uh see if Lou has any time or that would be if that would other be... member or other members of the cast. Um uh she's very close with the prodigy cast, um, disco, uh basically the the new Strange New Worlds, Disco and um uh uh, lower decks uh, oh and, lower and prodigy decks. so lower all, decks. All the, lower i'm decks so excited just, about lower decks being on strange new worlds i cannot contain my excitement right right so oh. uh aaron's first mention was in lower decks i forgot which episode what it what it was but um the captain wanted to do something stupid and they like the whole crew went 
Dr. Aaron says we can't do that. <laughs> that was the first line, and it was the meta line. But then at the in the finale of Prodigy season one, um, uh, uh, you you get to see it, technically it's Aaron's descendant, but it's still Dr. Aaron McDonald played by Dr. Aaron McDonald. <laughs> so so it fucking counts because Stephen Hawking played Stephen Hawking. Hawking. Yeah, it was not That's himself. So cool. It was like hologram Stephen Hawking. So that is yeah, so cool. fucking rad. So yeah, that would be that would be my table. So Todd, Todd, uh, Jerry, Terry, uh, uh, um, I always forget Jake Sisko's name. Ciroc. Thank you, Ciroc, and um, uh, Aaron and Blue. That's a good. Day. Absolutely, I, I would pay to see that game. <laughs> like I would All playing pay fucking to Star see. Trek. Oh, I would. And I, I know Todd could handle a large group like that, which would be rad. And I want to play the security red shirt officer that is probably going to die when the console explodes. <laughs> so we, me and Nina, we've been doing uh, binge watching uh, all of Star Trek. We finished Deep Space Nine. We started season one Voyager, which has been oh. difficult. Uh, so we took a break from Voyager to start up TNG. We, we got through Picard. the first season. Oh yeah, we finished Picard. We got through the first season of TNG, which was a little rough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's weird. So there's a there were a collection of writers um, through the early and latter part of TNG, and then most of Voyager. Um, that's why like. First seasons of Voyager, little rough. The first seasons of TNG, little rough. The last couple seasons of both, fucking amazing. Really good. Yeah. Those writers were not on DS9. I feel like DS9 had the strongest first season. That's because DSI, DS9 was not episodic. It was yeah. one continuous storyline throughout the entirety of the series. Yeah. Voyager, DS, uh, Voyager and TNG, and especially the original series, are and now strange new worlds because it is a callback to the original series they're episodic or like like one to three episodes are are, are a story arc it is this is the crew something bad happened it's the science three mystery. act play right yeah. yeah the three act science mystery ds9 was a continually story the entire way through and it is the only representation of the federation doing its fucking job Getting in the middle as a peace broker between two warring races. Yeah, and it's so good. So it's good. so good. In the character growth. I truly believe Nog has one of the best character arcs in all of Star Trek. And I will Without fight. a doubt. Without and I will Nog fight. Nog goes on the classic hero's journey. Yeah, it's and he's not even the main character. It's nope. just and it so resets. good. And it, it like First three seasons, his hero journey resets and it sucks. Resets and it sucks. And every time it resets, it's carrying forward in the series until he breaks those bonds. And then it's, let's fucking go, Ensign. Let's, let's go. Yeah. It's the thing about it is like, uh, no one gets the, uh, like, in, in, in a lot of Star Trek, there's not very many people that get the amount of character growth that even the most minor character in uh ds9 gets like damar right. goes from a single line uh in one episode to being the leader of the cardassian revolution right right uh you have goldicott um goes from generic generic named villain to holy shit level of antagonist yeah Garrett. Even, even morn gets a character arc Oh yeah, Morn. Yeah, absolutely. Morn gets a character so art. Um, <laughs> F's in chat for Morn. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's there is a ma God like the whole Garrick Bashir aspect. The oh. whole it's like the the acting also like the first handful of characters. Uh, sorry, the first handful of series uh, episodes. Word word use derp. Um, the first <laughs> handful of episodes. They were still feeling out their characters. Halfway through season one, everyone locks in. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it is it is on fucking point. And also 
The S9 is the provider of the single best fucking ship in you all goddamn of goddamn right! Starfleet. You goddamn right she's tough little ship! <laughs> the Defiant <laughs> was named the Defiant for a reason. It was one of the few Starfleet uh, vessels that were a warship. It's designed it was to fight created... the Borg. Yes. Yeah. It has transphasic shields. It has fucking rapid fire proton torpedoes. It Quantum was... torpedoes. It was so fucking good. And I am very <laughs> upset that the only other one in the Defiance class was the Sao Paulo. And they renamed the Sao Paulo, which had its own legacy as the new Defiant. Yeah. That really bothered me. They because also the had Defiant... the Valiant. Right. I'm, you're absolutely right. They also had the Valiant. Because the Defiant died a glorious death. Yeah. One of the few ships to remain standing in this massive onslaught. And then it finally went down. To take away the the legacy of another ship would be like having the having the Excelsior suddenly be named the Enterprise, or the Enterprise suddenly be named the Stargate, or the Titan suddenly being named the Enterprise. That bothered me. A lot. That bothered me a lot too. I'm not gonna lie. It's like there, there's a reason these ships are named, and there's a reason why Star Trek has always followed the naval conventions of ships. They are an action, a uh, a verb, an ad description, or a person. The defiant was it was defiant. The valiant was valiant. The enterprise was named after a series of exploration ships. The titan it was the fucking flagship motherfucker. It was the biggest goddamn thing. It's the titan. I it's like the proto star. It's an advanced. It, it, it's you know it's an advanced uh, class ship, the Voyager. All of these things, they're specifically named the Reliant. You know all all of this. To rename a ship does an injustice to the ship that is being renamed and the ship that it was named. I I will hundred percent agree with you. I would have loved for them to name the new Defiant the Triumphant. Like that would have been right, right, Exa exactly. But it's like the Sao Paulo had a history, the Valiant history, all of that. Valiant got taken down but, because a white boy, white boy, too hard. Right, but <laughs> NX NX seven four two zero five, the USS Defiant was there. It was in the shit. And it did its job. It's also the only Starfleet vessel that had a, uh, a cloaking, cloaking device. device. Yeah. Yep. yep. Until, I, yeah. um, but yeah. But again, that was just like, in the moment in yeah. in in Picard when they're at the museum and there's the Defiant. I'm like, that's the fucking Sao Paulo. It's not the Defiant. <laughs> <laughs> growl, growl, growl. And uh, my ass started to cry. So that that entire so Picard season three spoilers, by the way, if you haven't seen it, uh, tough shit. It's been out for a long time at this point. Get Paramount Plus. It's fucking great. It's it's great. When there is that scene, because we're all we're all Trek we're all Trekkies here. We're all absolute Star Trek nerds. The three of us. When the scene of seven sitting in the captain's chair of the Titan and Jack Crusher comes in and she begins zooming in and pulling up the stats on all of these ships and the faint notes of the themes of all of those series start to play. When I heard the first initial tones of Voyager as she pulls up the silhouette of Voyager. I fucking lost it. I started crying. There's someone online that did such a beautiful edit of that. Where, because she gives like a brief history to Jack about what she's looking at. Yeah. And they interpose cuts of the show 
and, oh. and of seven becoming acquainted with the crew and the ship and all of the hardships that the Voyager went through, like that got me bawling. That got me in my feelings so hard. Yeah. It is. It's also Voyager also has the single bat single best introductory open of any it, Star Trek show. Yeah. That's why season one is so fucking obnoxious to get through for me, because it's just like they set the bar here and yeah. then the entire first season, the, it's they, they never meet it again. Yeah. Second crawls back third, fourth, fifth is getting there. Six. Just, it just goes. And it's fucking amazing. The, 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 Jesus. Season six of Voyagers. Oh, my God. But just those images, because TNG had like a beautiful, big, you know, big uh, saucer section ship going past planets and nebulas and all that. And DS9 has the station, beautiful pans, beige or in the background, opening wormhole, you know, all this stuff. But then you have Voyager flying above the rings of a planet with the impulse engine waves appearing in the ring. Yeah. Coming out of a, out of a, uh, you know, out of the angle of a star, just, it, it has come back to exploration, but it is just so visually stunning that no other Star Trek show has gotten even close to that. My main yeah. problem with, and, I love Voyager, like with my whole heart, but my main problem with like, the first couple seasons is that it feels like the writer's wanted to do something very good and very compelling and then they pull their punches at the last second and none of it matters yeah there are some really good first and second season shows but they're very few and far between yeah. and yeah and like i'm sad that kess didn't have kess was being set up to have such a great arc and then her arc begins and you're going holy shit kess is and gone yeah. God damn it. And then they um, bring Kess back for one episode, but she's evil. Right, right. Yeah, they 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 do the uh they do the Tasha Yar. Yeah. Um, dark Kess. <laughs> spoilers, by the way. For a, a um, show that's been out since the early aughts. Nineteen late yeah, late nineties. Um, <laughs> yeah, when did Next Generation begin? Like eighty nine or something like that? Eighty seven. Eighty seven. Fuck. Yeah, we're I'm watching the, those original CGI effects. Something yeah, pretty rough. Yeah, and and the 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 remastered the remastered versions. Um uh so there was there's the remastered ones that they're that they're upscaled and they look cool. But then there's the remastered slightly tweaked ones where they adjust hues and everything so you don't see the seams in the carpet. You don't see the very, very bland. All it is is strips of colors on the L cars behind the uh, uh, behind the captain's chair. All that because it was filmed in fucking standard standard definition mm -hmm. in the late eighties, early nineties. We didn't have sixteen by nine four K fucking TVs and all of that. So it, when it gets upscaled, you're all of a sudden going. Oh God, that looks like shit. Yeah, who's that? Yeah. Who's that obvious extra? That's not Riker standing in the background. Right, <laughs> right, right. It's like Picard has more hair. What? You know, thing, things like That's that. It's like, wait a minute. Yeah, it's like, wait a minute. Worf's headpiece is peeling up in that scene because he whipped. He, you know, did a quick, you know, whip for that whip pan, and it just kind of went. You know that that kind of deal. But yeah, man, Trek, Trek all the way, and I'm not a yeah. Trek versus Wars. Wars has its own place. Yeah, Trek has its own those place. people are obnoxious. If you ask me, like the fandom menace. Yeah, I, I I truly believe when Star Trek fandom is at its best, it's fucking glorious. But when they're at yeah. their worst, it's the opposite. There is a like, glorious movie called Fanboys. I love, I love Fanboys. You've seen it? Oh yeah. God, we're one of the few. I've seen it. Oh, thank, thank fuck. Um, to those who have not seen it, and it is an amazing film that's about people uh, that are driving across the country to break into this film and see the movie of Batman. That's what it is. And I'm not spoiling anything, but there are two uh, two times where it's Trek, Trek versus Wars, 
and, and even, even though, though it's play play community value, no, no really bad, bad shit happens. Bad. Yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt. There's, uh, the reason why they're traveling across the country is because one of their friends is, uh, uh, has cancer, I believe. They don't find that out until, oh, halfway, until halfway through. Halfway that's there. right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And that, that's a really touching moment. That is a, yeah, it's a, such a good film. Yeah. It's, it's, it's wild cast too. Yeah. Yeah. They um, got the guy from, uh, how to train your dragon in that one. Jay yep. Uh, yep. Yeah. Um, Seth, uh, Seth Rogen's in it. Um, yep. as, bunch of Canadian a kids in that one. Bunch of Canadians. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's like Seth Rogen adjacent. So all the Seth, Seth Rogen kids are in it or like a couple of them. And then it, so yeah, the it's such a great movie. cast basically. It actually, yeah, yeah you're a hundred percent right. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's really good. I highly recommend it. Um, but it, it really does show in a funny light fan obsessions mm -hmm. and uh... yeah and it's great to see you know trek and wars and a film together and they fight it's really funny you get a back to the future thing in there and it'll just wipe the floor with both of them because back <laughs> to the future again is the best fucking trilogy that ever was made <laughs> come on a car as a time machine that beats a hot tub. That beats a police box. That police beats a chair you watch with a spinny mouth. thing behind it. <laughs> you watch your goddamn mouth. It's a fucking stainless steel gold wing V6 DeLorean with thrusters and a fusion generator in the end of her. Why a DeLorean? For style. Exactly. It's like if you're going to have a time machine, you want to do it with some style. This is garbage as fuel, man. <laughs> In, yeah, in the second in the one. end of the first one and through the second one, but he uses you uh um he uses uranium uh in yeah. the first. Uh there, there's one I have one gripe with Back Utonium. to the Future. Mm -hmm. I have one gripe with Back to the Future, and it's specifically with Back to the Future 2. Uh mostly it's because uh they did not expect uh what was her name? Um Oh um Marty's uh, love interest. Yeah, yeah um Jennifer, even the direct the, Yeah, even the, the director said the, yeah that if I knew we were going to get a second movie, I would not have put her in that fucking car. Yeah. Because they exactly. had to basically write her out. They're like, we're going to stick her here and then have her pass out, stick her here, and then forget about her for the rest of the film. They reshot the entire ending of part one as the beginning of part two in order to explain, uh, to introduce the character, uh, the, the casting chip. Yeah. Yeah. And if you play those at the same time, they're pretty fucking close. They do, they do a good job with that. But again, it was one of those things where it's like, the, the story was not supposed to focus uh, on her. And if I if like we had known we were getting a second one, I wouldn't have done it that way. And I'm like, I kind of yeah. understand that. I kind of get that. At the same time, you, you did her dirty. Uh, I yeah. recently watched a Michael J. Fox documentary a shout out to that guy for the amount of work he did. Oh, uh, on that what, what movie. is it called? Still? Yeah. Yeah. That's oh the my one. God. He was doing family ties at the same time he was filming Back to the Future. So he yes. would wake up extraordinarily early to go film family ties. Then he would like get maybe an hour break while being driven to the set wherever they were doing back to the future they would film all night he would get maybe another two hours of sleep and they'd have to be back to do family ties again yep. that is hard work especially with everything that he had to deal with so like yeah shout out oh, to yeah. that dude and then pulling in like doing weekend long weekend long day shoots for back to the future while learning lines for next week's episode of family ties yeah that was that was amazing. And then all of a sudden they decided, wait, fuck it. Family ties is over. Let's shoot two and three back to back. Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot of fucking work. Whoa. Yeah. That's that heavy. Was... That little yeah. Canadian was working his ass off. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. No, he's, um, yeah, that whole <laughs> series. I've got Back to the Future Legos. I uh, I have the hat. I have the hoverboard. Did you? That yeah. is my. Did you get the uh, copy no. of the newspaper when uh, the 30th yes. anniversary came out? Yeah. Yep. So I was all over the place on Back to the Future Day in 2015. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, everywhere I rented 
a DeLorean for my birthday that year. Oh, that's Hell awesome. yeah, you did. Uh, fuck yeah, I did. Um, <laughs> I went and saw it. I saw the trilogy in a outdoor setting. I went on the tour that went to the Pasadena location of Dr. Brown's house, the Burger King, all of that. Uh, went to the mall, which was the Fox Hills Mall. Um, did everything else, and then was uh, got one of the lucky tickets, and then got a VIP upgrade to watch the first movie on the lawn in Universal Studios of Clock to- of the Back to the Future Clock Tower. Oh Square. hell yeah! Of of yeah, That's and so that was cool. that blew yeah, me away scary. because everyone, all everyone who had a uh a tricked out back to the future style delorean drove them all onto the lot and around uh around the uh townhouse square and it was just like i am walking i am walking back in time this is fucking weird and so, yeah i i i have one of the greatest gripe. days of my life what's your gripe i have one great with back to the future bring it i blame that movie for the Cubs winning because the Cubs won in the same year that they won in Back to the Future, followed by Trump being elected, which is, listen, Biff is Trump. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I believe those two were inspired by that movie. Well, you can also say the Simpsons did it too. Oh, uh, Simpsons did it. Simpsons did it. Yep. Um, yeah, the, the, the Cubs thing was wild when that started to happen and yeah. but like there is there were no there's no florida team thankfully they weren't they were if they were so if the cubs were playing a florida team with a mascot that is a gator <laughs> at that point i would have tracked down every single person that ever worked on back to the future and held them and going tell me the secrets of the next 20 years <laughs> because they somehow know Where's the sports almanac? Yeah, give me the almanac now. <laughs> but that I think that was only good till 2015. So it would have just yeah. been the rest of that year, and then we would just been fucked. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna have to play some bets in December. Yeah, no, that's a good point. You had all of November and December to do it. Yep. You could do some. You could do some good damage. Yeah, you could. Okay. You could rake in some money. Yeah. But- I love time travel. Time travel movies are my bread and butter. Really I love are. time travel with my whole heart. That's why I put it in most games that I play. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, yeah. There is one more first half question that we have to ask you, and I'm very excited for your answer on this one. You are the god emperor of the TTRPG space for one day. You I snap your f- the second. You snap your fingers and your will be done if you decide I want this company to be as big or bigger than Watsy, it happens. Whatever you say happens. So, what three things do you do? I elevate Talon and Claw to Wormwood status because yes! they are good people. And I wish... I have to flex. <laughs> Oh, yeah, you got the fucking Odin. Oh, God, the Odin is so good. I have to flex. Look at this. Oh, it's beautiful. Oh, look at this. Talon and Claw all day. I have to flex, too. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. (laughs) Pick Vestry, Fabula, and Sip It means your story begins here. Oh, I have them custom burn that into it. See, the next one I get, I'm going to get custom. Uh, This is just their standard Odin. No, dude, Uh, that is not standard. So the Odin, there is very few of them because that is a um, that is a collaboration and it is multi laser cut, multi engraved. The Odin is fucking godsend no pun intended a godsend of a screen St- screen that is that is so amazing but yeah i want i i want talon and claw and everyone uh that works for them to immediately be elevated from henceforth 
to holy shit levels of awesome yes. and hire a good group of people and a good group of woodworkers and make good quality products, do collaborations with, um, uh, with, uh, um, oh God, what, what's his name? Um, but like, uh, the, the folks at dog might like, yes. I want all, I want all of the small woodworking companies that produce dice vaults and all that to create some super collab thing where they all become fucking awesome. If that's, I make another right. shout out to Dragonburn Studios. Oh my God, I want, oh my God, I want a Dragonburn box so fucking bad. So you can so see here, bad. I've got custom engraved the Noir Enigma on the front and it's also on the side. Okay, our, okay, if we're doing show and tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fucking on. That was a dog might screen. I want um, a dog yeah, might dog screen might too. Did the, um, dog might did the accessible, uh, the screens for the accessible kits for uh, the D and D accessible kits. Oh shit! And they they are um, embedded with magnets that have clear things, so you can put them behind them, so they're easy to read. They come apart with. So they have magnets in the middle and then they have a bar so you can hinge it. You can put a two panel, a three panel or a four panel. It's really awesome. Um, <laughs> we're doing show and tell. The Elderwood Academy Master Tome. Oh, that's oh! beautiful. That's beautiful. So I, I have it in uh, gold, gold dragon leather and emerald dragon le leather with silver trim and uh, gold leaf um it is big it is heavy this That's is my travel gorgeous. screen and shit but so it can go into two configurations as a screen it can go vertical and it can go uh vertical like this so it's nice and huge and tall or it can go horizontal the thing is they put the logo so normally the logo is 90 degrees anti-clockwise I'm always going to use this in its short configuration. So I asked them to put their logo sideways. So That's it's always beautiful. face up, including on the back where it says Elderwood Academy. Ooh. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I, mm, I love this thing. And, uh, God, I, I would open it up, but I've got like a shit ton of dice in here that'll fall out. Same, oh, same thing with this. Uh, but, this guy has the dice catapult in there. Oh, oh my god, I want the dice catapult so bad. It's he, it's yeah. so fucking gorgeous. See, uh, oh, I'm actually able to do it without spilling stuff. So that's so much fun. Bing. That's so cool. That is so <laughs> fucking cool. And also shout out to Elderwood who did my uh, dice vaults with my logo on them. Oh, Very that's cool. sick. Yep, Saber Cat Industries. Where paleontology and storytelling meet. I just Hell came up with that right now. Nice. No, you need to make that the tagline. I think I'm going to. But <laughs> yeah, I so yeah, one of one of the things I would do is elevate a ton of small creators to massive status. C9 Labs, Talon and Claw, Elderwood, Dogmite, Dog um, Volinar, yeah. um, Dragonburn. These these uh, uh, fucking 88 ribbles, ri ri you know, riddles and Kate. All of these, they're they're at a point. Works of whimsy, whimsy with Greenleaf Geek, who does these amazing little uh, like uh, little dice books that open up, and you can like put dice in there and shit like that. Oh, um, special uh, shout out to Volinar, by the way. That dude is just one of the best people I know in the space. Seriously. Oh yeah, absolutely. Justice and yeah, you know, uh, Justice Hughes from Barden Barbarian and his pens. These pens I want to get one of those so bad. Uh, like all these people that do this handcrafted stuff that are that it if you email or even publicly ask Talon and Claw, hey, could you do this? They will make a way to do it. If not, they will tell you straight up, no, we can't do that, but we can do something like this as opposed to very large company that'll say, yeah, no problem. And then send you a piece of shit because they can't figure it out. <laughs> Same with Elderwood. Hey, Elderwood, can you put this on a dice vault or something like that? Sure. 
That's not a problem. Send us the picture. Okay. Yeah. Fucking laser engraved on it. Here's Dogfight, how same thing. Volinar, same thing. C9, same thing. Fucking riddles. Uh, 88 riddles. That man, 88 riddles and, uh, and Zero and Kate are three of the greatest fucking artists that so few people know. All of the bitchin' artwork that is on a lot of Talon and Claw's stuff, like the DM, like the Odin, the scroll work, all of that is zero fucking 88 riddles in Kate. Uh, and I was just going to say, here's how clutch Volinar is. I just randomly put, like, one of the things I hate most about being in my small apartment is I can't get a gaming t- uh, table uh, because I just don't have the room. He slid in my DMs and went, hey, whenever you do find yourself in a space where you can get a gaming table, tell me what you want it to be like and we can work on making that happen for you. And I'm like, dude, like, I, I don't even, like, know what my budget or anything with it like that would be because that's so far ahead in the future. I don't know when I'll be in a new space. It's like, hey, you don't worry about that. You just tell me what your dream table is, and we'll work together to make it happen. Right, Hell right. Yeah. That, that is something like community. That is... yes reaching out and being like hey this is my wheelhouse this is something that you know let me use my expertise to help you that is what i want to fuel in this space not killing each other and i i cannot stress enough support these creators like fuck yeah support these guys they're look look at this fucking thing look at this yeah. fucking thing it's beautiful and like just you you don't have to go with the brand that's the most popular you, no you, you go with the people that are passionate about the shit they put out exactly and um if if you look at something like because ought to be a hundred percent honest how a lot of talent and claw screen screens are not cheap that no, is because yeah. they are incredible one they're heavy they're like four pounds oh yeah. this is this is not you know this is not a dm screen no you put it on a table, it goes thud, and that fucker doesn't move. It's impressive. And it smells. It smells so good. I oh. cannot stress. Uh, like there are times I just sit with this, and just go. Oh yeah, mine. Mine is oh. uh, Paddock and Wenge, and I cannot find the seams between the two different kinds of woods, and they both smell so radically different. I'm just like, this is. I just. I'm like, I'm just going to put a candle an unscented candle behind the screen in front of my keyboard, just so the air is warm. So it pulls the scent of the screen toward me because I'm that level of scent nerd. Um, but a hundred percent. Yeah. That is, that is one thing I would do immediately somehow give them all the budgets to collaborate on this one massive thing that elevates all of them to holy fuck status because I when okay when Elderwood approached me to do the Sabercat logo dice vault they're like hey we want we want to do a dice vault and we want to help you with your medical debt and all that I'm like okay cool that's rad I had I I paid a friend of mine to come up with the logo Alex Holt if you're looking for logo and art designs Um, he's on Twitter. Um, and I gave him a rough idea because I, I, I don't do art. So like the creative director of the, no, I'm like, it would be cool to have a black Jersey with a big red ampersand on it. The back's a dungeon master. That's my, that's, that's what I do with this. It's like, Alex, I want a saber tooth cat skull with a rock hammer and a fountain pen. It's like, uh, Okay. And sends me a couple iterations. I'm like, yes, that's what's in my head. I can't, I can't do a stick figure without a ruler and prayer. <laughs> I am not artistically minded. I can make Hero Forge shit look good, and I can paint miniatures really well because they are within a set dimension. Like you only have so many colors and so many things that I can do. But drawing and all that, sketching, I am shocked at how artists can do that. 
So they did that and I put it on. They're like, okay, so how much uh, it's like, this is what we're going to sell them for. This is the affiliate percentage. Da, 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 da. I'm like, no, 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 no. I want the barest. I want the minimum affiliate percentage. I want you guys to get most of the money. I will, I will, I like, I took 10% slightly above tax. That's it. You know, honestly, just, uh, just to hop in uh, back to the original question. If I were God Emperor for a day, mm -hmm. I would have Critical Role auction off the table that they're currently using because we know who it's from. And we know somebody will buy it. Yep. I would like the proceeds to go to a charity, preferably one that's CRF. Supposed... Yes, I would. I would oh, absolutely. I would. Yeah. I, I would love for that money to go, especially to the trans community, because right now you, you, you put the water where the fire is and yep. the fire is at our trans brothers and sisters and we need to help them as much as possible. And yes. then I would like that major project that you're talking about to be the new table because that I would be oh dude yeah that'd be fucking amazing because that would again we're looking to get these people on a platform that will raise them and yeah. listen let's let's not let's let's not be naive part of the reason why wormwood got as big as they did was because of their partnership with critical role yep I uh, would love re remember the dice vault giveaways yeah and all that a number of mm -hmm. years ago. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's exactly what it was. And then and unfortunately, I, the smaller people did not get that, you know, recognition like Gil. Yeah. Blacksmith Gil. Yeah. I Gil. would I would love for them to fix that. And I think that this is a way that would fix that where it's positive for everybody except Wormwood. We just sell off the original table. It will be a collector's item. It oh, yeah. will go so there's some billionaire TTRPG fanboy that will spend whatever money to get that table. Good. Use that money to help people and then make a big, as big of a thing as they made out of Critical Role Land, mm -hmm. do it again. But this time we're going to support these, we're going to support these small creators and get them to the level of where the other folks were. Right. Heck yeah. Yeah, no. I, I absolutely agree. That would be that would be perfect. And a, and a, a couple of those companies I mentioned, they actually started as furniture makers. Yeah, they know what the fuck they're doing. Yeah, like mm -hmm. yeah, oh yeah. I lo I love when somebody rants about their special interests. And there was just a week of all in our kind of taking me through something that he was building. I didn't understand half of it, but what I understood was this is somebody that's excited to be building what they're building right and god i, I want that I, I want that win for them mm -hmm. that would yeah that would be that would be amazing that would be really fun yeah that is that is what i would do and then because all of those people in turn would turn and lift up others yes none so, of them would stand on each other absolutely. they would immediately reach out and go yeah, you can have one of these too. Come here. Help the crabs out of the bucket. Don't pull each other down. Right. Thank you. Right. For fuck's right. sake. Make a crab chain and get people out. Claw to claw and pull. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, fuck the crab bucket. You've got two more commandments to make. Oh, shit. Um, and I know, babe, I'm, I got it. I know. I know. Or we, we're running late, aren't we? Oh, no, we're just going to take a quick break after these, oh, after this answer. After these messages. Okay. <laughs> after these messages. Um, now, I'll, back to the show. Uh, uh, cool. I'll, <laughs> I'll go quick. Um, I would uh, change every executive at Wizards of the Coast and make them part of the community so they know where the fuck they're doing and they understand what's going on and they become uh, very progressive and fix all the fucking problems um, so we can actually have a grand unified uh game space of people um so you know things like that um that actually wouldn't take a whole lot of money so um god what i don't know a third i can't yes i know a fucking third you know how you have dean the dnd &D crews mm -hmm. dnd &D in a castle 
and like super popular tables and D&D TV shows and all that. I want to run the first D&D game at the space station. <laughs> yes. Fuck that Star Trek in space. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, something like that. I want to run yeah. an RPG in space. Yes, that is very fucking 100% very selfish, but there's something behind it because that that act will be a redemption act not me drunk yelling at people telling them <laughs> that they're wrong and then to embrace science that that will literally be like hey you the emo kid way in the back that likes role playing games that's picked on in school that wears metal t-shirts that does things like that you trevor of 30 years ago at some point you will come up with something to combine two passions of yours and then show that those things can be done hell yeah i want to do it because yes i would love to do that but i want to do it to show people that yeah things like this can happen and we could figure out how to roll dice in microgravity and all that. But I want that kid going, I really like space and role playing games to turn into a YouTube feed of a fucking D and D game or star Trek game or star Wars, the role playing game, something like that on a fucking space station or in, or like in a lander on the moon, maybe on Mars, if not me, then someone, I want there to be a broadcast RPG from space. Yes. To combine space. space and storytelling to combine them together. And yeah, I think that would be I think that would be a rad moment and it would unify a lot of people because oh, yeah. there are nerds on both sides that really like both and then they can figure out, holy shit, I can do the same thing at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> Hell fucking yeah. Yeah, I, I, I would want, yeah, not necessarily mean, fuck it, that was a selfish thing, but someone run, someone unknown. Someone You're the new. god emperor, you could be selfish. <laughs> no, 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 I still wouldn't, because like I was saying with the Elderwood stuff, I took the minimum because I just want cool people to have cool things. True. That's all. That that That's it. Like, yeah, if they make some, if the conglomerate of awesomeness makes a really big cool table i even if i was you know duke leto the second um deep cut there for <laughs> those of you that read dune um <laughs> but i wouldn't want that table or a table like it true i you know that kind of thing yeah i would like something like can i get i get a jersey sent to me that that's that's my contribute my contribution i just want other people to have really cool fucking stuff Heck yeah. And I think that act would give a whole lot of cool people a whole lot of cool ideas on how to do a whole lot of cool shit. Yeah, you're removing you're removing a limit that we place on our hobby just because we think it's outlandish. Part of doing something incredible is believing it's possible. Right. So. And why not make it commonplace? Like yeah. pronouns, like people who you know it's like trans people people who don't feel comfortable with who they are but who they want to be these are very simple things that can be commonplace we just need we need that push to make people understand oh no it's actually fine <laughs> this I mean, is season two of picard <laughs> right <laughs> it's just like no like we can do this and that, I think, a very small part of it, but there would be a large part, like a small group of people, hopefully influential people that would see that and go, holy fuck, that is a cool idea. Let's promote that in STEM. How about instead of science, there's a aspect of, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math that is storytelling, you know, tabletop, you know, entertainment and something else that begins with M, uh, probably math because rolling fucking dice, magic. Here we go. Two stems combining together. 
why can't it's like why can't science and and you would and science and entertainment science and role playing games exist? You would think that we would put that together strictly on the merit of a lot of our technological advances have been Star Trek nerds going, how do we make this real? Or sci-fi nerds going, how do we make this real? There is a endless endeavor to create a real lightsaber and nobody would be working on that if the idea of a lightsaber had, didn't exist. Yeah, if it wasn't compelling enough to try it. But right. that is, yes, that is trying to help, That that's trying to help bring something into the world from something 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 fictional and i get that and that's fucking cool i want the physical and the imaginary to combine because yeah having a fucking lightsaber would be rad dangerous as fuck really rad those actual tricorders that work that is fucking great and that at some point hopefully will help the medical community i i have an original star tech star tech flip phone that was uh inspired by the uh, communicators in the original season, but I, I want the concept of the imagination, somebody telling a story. The reason why I want this is because, um, fuck stupid aphasia astronaut Canadian Chris, Roberta Bondar or Chris Hadfield. Thank you. Chris Hadfield. Chris Hadfield was the storytelling astronaut. Yes. He was the simple explainer. It's like, this is why, this is why water creates a globe in microgravity. I'm going to play my, my guitar and sing space oddity. He was oh, the I do story. Know I didn't know he was oh, Canadian. Yeah. yeah. Um, he's a storytelling astronaut. He, he did, he did what Carl Sagan did to a younger, to a much older generation. We just need to pump that up a little bit. And then go, yeah. okay, but now let's tell a story of a fictional world as of like where the storyteller is orbiting this planet and a group of people are doing something on this planet to help save it. A story in orbit. I love yeah. it. Yeah. I love it. D, yeah. D&D in space. <laughs> I'm assuming we're a, taking a bio break and then coming back or are we ending yeah. this thing? Oh no, we're we're gonna take a quick fiver to be human for a second. Mm -hmm. Then we'll then we'll come back with the dark ropes, which is essentially the same thing as the first half. We just give it an A. Right All on, right, right on. Okay. So now I can I can pull my human skin off and be my reptilian <laughs> self. Yeah, and I'm gonna I'm gonna take off my fake human mask and put on my real human mask. Okay, okay, cool. I have to align <laughs> the telescope to better see the flat earth. <laughs> Uh, uh, so yeah, I'll be back after I, uh, I'm not drinking tea. I'm actually drinking human blood. So yeah. Um, I guess we'll be back. Is that after not this. tea? We'll see yeah. You we'll soon. be back in a bit. We'll see you soon. Uh, when it's like drinking human blood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are we back on? Yeah, we are. Oh yeah. Yeah. We're live. Typo is the best. Hi right. everybody. <laughs> Make sure, my, make sure my reptile, my, my human mask is back on. I stopped being a white guy. <laughs> well, that's problematic. <laughs> that's so problematic, dude. <laughs> this was an elaborate ruse. That, that's like, that, that's like, um, that's like chasing Amy Star Wars. It's like the, the baddest brother in the universe opens his helmet and he's a frail white man. It's like that is one of the greatest lines. Like in it, it's so good. They want us to believe, and it's just like pulling out the gun. Yeah, it's like un underrated Kevin Smith movie. Um, uh, I, yeah. I love I love Kevin Smith even with some of his issues. Oh, <laughs> wait, no worries. Why you lie to me? <laughs> it, issues or subscriptions? There's a little bit of a yeah he's got magazines but you know i still love his work oh anyway i changed my hat um i found it this is open circuit studios this is the uh twitch channel that leverage is on on wednesday they're oh. actually in chat too are they open circuits here yeah. they were uh they were i don't know if they're still here oh mm -hmm. fuck yeah what's up open circuit <laughs> but this is the Dark roast, and we have a few established segments here. So dark we're just roast gonna... or dark room? Dark roast. roast. Oh right, because 
Morning. Off he got Coffee, it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm drinking tea. Is that okay? That's fine. Uh, yeah, I'm drinking ciders. Blood. Oh yeah, <clears throat> no, it's tea. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm totally not wiping cocaine from my nose. <clears throat> Baby, uh, in yeah. their culture, <clears throat> tea is blood. Um, <laughs> no, I'm awake. It's fine. I'm okay. It's all right. Sniffling like our president or our ex president. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so Rub here, out of all of my gums. <laughs> The first question that we have, or the first segment rather, is TTRPG confessionals. <laughs> if there is something that you feel that you do at the table that is not quite becoming, or if you have a bad habit at the table, this is where we come to confess. Um, I lead by example, so here is my confession. Uh, some GMs don't like this, but I like to use characters that I've used in previous campaigns and use the stories that I, I was telling with those characters as the backstory for the character in the game that I'm in. Um, I currently have a, I currently have a GM that's a little less than enthused about that, <laughs> but you know, I mean, yeah, no, I, 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 I get that. that. <laughs> all, all of all of um like first of all all of i don't know if it's really i'm because I'm, I'm sure everybody does it every character i play is some kind of uh some kind of aspect or flaw or something about me right like uh mac my minotaur gunslinger is because i used to be a uh three gun uh competition I'm a trained uh, range safety officer. I own firearms. I also believe they should be well, well more regulated than they are. Seriously. Um, like, holy shit, seriously. Um, but like Mac, he's that. And he's also my insecurity of, uh, of he, he's also my separation anxiety. He has real big problems with, uh, the other players on he does really bad things but he 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 never wants to be he never wants to be away from them even when he's off doing something else uh he tries to do good for his good do by good do good by his friends even if that means he's the one that takes the shit and yeah. does the shit um like yeah, like all of my you know all characters i play have some aspect of me in it my grung monk rico is my alcoholism he's a he's a uh, drunken master monk and you know everything like that um i don't i don't really see that as much of a confession but what is something i do i do not fudge rolls i don't believe in that if something crits against me or I crit against them, that is, that's just that, that is the plot twist that the dice have decided. I, I will tweak stories, not necessarily railroading, but I will advance clocks in order to give my players either more, uh, more choices or more story beats to follow. Uh, either to advance the story a little bit, even though it's still their story, I'll throw in a couple hooks that shouldn't be thrown in yet, but that I could improv my way in. Um, pro easily a quarter of my games are complete improv. Yeah. I'll either forget a name, forget an accent, have to come up with something on the fly. Um, ah, something hi, Raiders! Like that. Oh, yay! What's <sighs> up? Hey, Raiders from the Lovely. Hi, Sam. So uh, Sam is also our science, our our science friend. This is oh, the here's the Sam that, you're talking about. Uh, uh, they they are they are the Sam that I would love to get you two in a room to just hear y'all go wild about science. Okay, maybe in another 10, 20 episodes, why don't we have two guests and we just rip off on it? I swear to God, like we could even we could start a show just called "That's Not Science," <laughs> or just watch movies and y'all can destroy the science in them. I'm fucking down. B movies <laughs> and bad science, <laughs> oh, something like that. Oh, that would be sick. <laughs> yeah, like I, it's weird. I'm an open. I'm a very open book. Um. 
trying to think of weird, con- like not even weird, but like a dark confession that I would have. Um, I never actively target players or characters. Yeah, don't fudge rolls. I will use, I will use, uh, like you said, I will use my own characters as NPCs or their backstories to fuel uh, another character's story. Absolutely. Okay, I got one. I am notorious and guilty of really digging into characters' backstories and using them as story beats, but I do I I do aim for if there's a little bit of trauma in their backstory, if our safety tools allow, I will dial that to eleven. Case in mm. point, in my home game, and I, I cleared this with the player, in my home game, one of the characters is um uh, disassociated from uh, from their parents, um, doesn't like their mother, their mother was an asshole, that whole thing. There is currently an entire subplot where their mother is now the queen regent of an elven city and is tearing the city apart. And she has completely usurped power and had the character arrested and brought to the city. And there is this whole abandonment. How dare you leave storyline going on? And I keep checking in with the players like, no, 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 that's great. Because they have had those problems in this. Like the player has had those problems. So I will, uh, I always use safety tools, but I will, I will take them. I will take them to the edge. And they have absolutely every single time to say nope that's that's a little too far i will clear storylines with characters before see i don't think that's a sin i like that some people would view that as a sin you know because some people would view mine as a sin it qualifies okay no valid but yeah give me give me a vague backstory i'll fill it in give me a detailed backstory i will fuck shit up prime (laughs) example leverage on Open Circuit Studios, the mastermind, Donnie O'Connor, played by Finn R. Pearson, uh, he gave me a very detailed dossier on his character. The entire second season has been his old team trying to get revenge on him. <clears throat> To the point where our hacker, played by Lamar the Con guy, successfully made a hacker role to find out information on Donnie and I immediately DM'd Finn. I'm like, I'm going to dump the dossier to him. Is there anything you don't want in it? He's like, just the stuff that we did between the seasons because no one knows that. I'm like, okay. So I deleted that in my copy of the, re- of the dossier and sent the entire document. Players to give a detailed backstory do so as a step-by-step outline for how to fuck their character up. Uh, exactly. <laughs> You're right, Sam. Uh, 100%. I will... <laughs> This is yeah. the thing that will make me cry. <laughs> the more detailed you give it to me, the more the the larger number of knives I can insert slowly and twist. Yeah. Because stories good stories are both born out of happiness and trauma. Because to overcome that trauma is one of the greatest things a person can do. True. And I want to give them every chance to overcome that trauma because I believe in heroes and I, you know, and if the players want to be heroes, then fuck right on. Let's go be heroes. If they want to run an entire evil campaign. Sure. Because (laughs) villains can view themselves as heroes in a different way. Lawful evil still follows laws. They're just really shitty laws. (laughs) <laughs> we're living that now um, right. <laughs> oh my gosh america is so lawful evil <laughs> oh no no they're 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 capitalist evil which is like a subset it's a subset of neutral evil because that's selfishness and lawful evil because they have to pass the laws in order to embrace the neutral evil selfishness true 
Yeah. So it's capitalist evil. It's a very close, it's closely related to chaotic stupid. <laughs> Anita, do you have a sin for us? Uh, sometimes I say beta cuck on stream and I'm not sorry about it. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> You did it again. It's not. It's not a bad. That's it's it's a bad thing to say. But uh, I, it's a bad thing to say. But the, but the thing is, well, one, there I is no concept of alpha. purposes. Yeah, there's no concept of alphas and betas in nature. That is complete. That's a complete falsehood. Packs work together as a group. But for the good of the group, um, there is like trying to use cuck as a pejorative for cuckolding. I, I think the people that are attempting to use it don't <laughs> understand that it is a kink. It is, it is a sexual kink that is embraced wholeheartedly by the people that do it. If you call someone whose uh, who's, uh, sexual awakenings and, and kinks and everything include that, you're not insulting them. <laughs> I never looked at it that way. <laughs> because think about it. You're calling someone who gets gratification both sexual and non-sexual of being cuckolded you're you're calling them that it, it, it it's akin to you know it, it's it's akin to in like you know virulently insulting a masochist like like, what the fuck are you doing? They, they, they like this. <laughs> you're like you're feeding into the kink right now. Stop it. <laughs> right. Right. It, it's just like we don't kink that, that is, we kink ass why. Yeah, exactly. It, it's like that that's the funny thing about a lot a lot of you know a, a lot of the online space is that they attempt to use these pejoratives like like woke. Woke was started in the African American community as a extremely positive thing of people waking up to what is going on around them, specifically inherent systemic racism and such like that to turn it around and use it as pejorative. It's like, no dude, we, we are, you're always talking about that. You know, sheep have to wake up and now you're calling other people woke. <laughs> but are you dumb? Yes, that's an ableism. I'm sorry, but it's just like, it's like, it's like the let's go Brandon thing. I don't understand that because for four years, people were saying, fuck off Trump or fuck you Trump or, you know, fuck Trump and all that. And I had a person on a job site. No shit. Real quick story. Had a person on the job site. Look at my, I have a sticker on one of my water bottles. That is the, um, uh, that is the, uh, Jewish defense league but it's the secret secret Jewish space laser um, core because of the whole Rothschild space laser cut starting yeah. fire thing. And he's like, that's not funny. I'm like, no, it's fucking hilarious. The next day he came with a let's go Brandon sticker on his water bottle. And I'm like, he's like, what do you think of this? I'm like, Brandon, who's Brandon? Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. Let's go. Brandon. It's like, no, that's not what it means. I'm like, why not? We're celebrating Brandon. Yeah. Like, let's go. Brandon. Fuck. Yeah. It's he's like, like no, somebody it means who likes flowers and gardeners. <laughs> right, right. And he's like, no, it means it means fuck you, Biden. I'm like, then why don't you have a sticker that says fuck you, Biden? Are you ashamed to say that? Is that why you're saying it in code? <laughs> and he locked up. You saw the gears begin to seize. And he's looking. He's like, no, it it means it it it. Be, let's go, Brandon. Means I'm like, yeah, it means let's go, Brandon. If that means Biden, that's like, yeah, let's go, Biden. What the fuck are you? If Brandon is Biden, cool. Let's go Biden. Is that what you're trying to say? No, it's fuck you Biden. It's like, then why don't you have a sticker that says fuck you Biden? Why do you have to speak in code? Because for four years, none of us were. <laughs> and, and then that backfired with the whole creation of the meme Dark Brandon. So we, right. so we successfully right. co-opted their shit again. Yeah. It's like, let's go, Brandon. Okay. I am the evil. I will wreck everything. Dark Brandon Sith Lord. Yeah, it's like, I, I don't understand. Like, it's got to be an online culture thing. It's meme culture. And it, it it's people looking for the quip. It's people looking for the sound bite. And they, they don't think it all the way through. Be, because, like, it, 
in the early days of the internet and like actual discussion and all that, things were nuanced and come up in order to last. Like play him off keyboard cat. That still applies. <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, so I, I know the lore of Let's Go Brandon, and it's it's even dumber when you know the context. Oh yeah, it's a fucking NASCAR driver. Yeah. Who who, who sucked. And, and yeah, the, the the crowd was yelling "fuck you, Biden," but the person interviewing the NASCAR driver was like, "Oh, they're saying let's go, Brandon." Brandon. Yeah, yeah. So they actually took the insult that they were saying <laughs> and turned it into a misheard idiocy that they then used. <laughs> We never said fascists and white supremacists were smart. I will there there a lot of them are savvy though. Like yeah. very disturbingly American history acts like, no, don't shave your head anymore. Let's slowly infect these communities. Like, yeah, no, they're savvy. But yeah. once they open their mouth, it's like, yay, punch a Nazi time. Um <laughs> I do not advocate violence except against Nazis. <laughs> In which case we have it, we give you enthusiastic consent. Oh, oh, oh it, it's it's pistol whipping all day long. Let's <laughs> fucking go. I will hit them with my cane like a fucking baseball bat. Let's go, Brandon. <laughs> yeah, that's that that's that statement's probably gonna come and bite me in the ass. But honestly, if you have a problem with me saying baseball bat hurt and be violent against Nazis, well, there's a person playing cards with ten Nazis. There are 11 Nazis at the table. There you go. Whoa. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love I and you know the my more you know. My favorite thing is when they hide behind. No, I'm a collector. I just like collecting historical oh, pieces. Oh bullshit. Get bullshit. out of here. Bullshit. Get out of here. <laughs> It's like, oh, yeah, it's like, well, no, history has to be, history has to be maintained. Ask the country that it happened in. Walk down a street with a piece of Nazi paraphernalia in Germany and see what happens. I mean, truly, a, if this country gave a shit about history, I would know who my great, great, great grandfather was, but I don't. Because <laughs> somebody did keep the receipt. No. Oh, right. <laughs> Wow, that was a hard fucking turn. It's like fucking Anita's like, I say beta cup, beta cuck on stream. And here we go. Let's go. That wasn't even a tangent, dude. We jumped rails and then like <laughs> we took the L to an entirely different neighborhood. <laughs> there was a cool kick flip in between though. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> oh, we have a second part of the dark roast that we like to call Petty Prime Time, where if you will, if you have something to get off your chest, uh, we give you the space to do it in the form of a verbal subtweet. I am not one to ask for something without modeling the behavior, so I will do just that right now. Uh, and my oh, subtweet actually do a subtweet or. Oh no! You you will just say what the subtweet is. It, it'll oh, go. Okay. It'll go a little something like this. Um. If they're if you're enjoying the villain of the week storyline in Twitter, you probably should leave Twitter. You should probably take a step away, um, because that's not good for your soul. <laughs> Being amused and enthused for for the latest villain of the week on Twitter. It's not healthy. It's something I had to break myself out of. I've been happier ever since, and I highly recommend it for all of you as well. Uh, and the second thing that I'd like to add to this subtweet is everything exists on a spectrum. Going either side of a spectrum, going to either extreme on a spectrum usually is not good for you or your health. So if you're one of these people that want to yell at everybody all the time that's not good for you and if you're somebody that needs to hop on a pedestal and be the inspiration of the day every day that's not good for you either my friend S touch grass <laughs> there are both sides there's toxic uh negativity and there's toxic positivity 
Let's see. Does it have to be general or can it be specific? I mean, usually I do general for subtweet, but if you got something specific you want to get off your chest and you feel comfortable well, doing it, so. It, it, apply, it applies to more than one thing. Okay, but go for it. If your entire shtick on Twitch is to appropriate things such as African-American vernacular English or terms or phrases from a culture that is not your own in mm. order to drive views, make it edgy, or be that cool game-playing guy, don't fucking do it because it's offensive and dumb. Yeah. Yeah. It's like white guys with top knots should not being say should not being say but see hey yeah edit button <laughs> Boop. uh it's like you know your generic white guy with a top knot should not be saying things in aave or like you know, like fucking any anything from like it just it it fucking bugs me don't fucking do it be you guess yeah. what if nobody, if you don't like who you are or nobody else likes who you are, change your shit, but don't do other people's shit. I, that, that's, yeah. I like that, that. I know a couple of people that apply to, like, I, I have to, I have to tell, I have to expose black secrets. Da, da, da. This is where we would have the graphics for black secrets. Right. Yeah. Um, if you're, if you're a, 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 a white guy and your whole deal is like, Look at look at all my friends. I only hang out with black people, and I talk black, and you know I date black and black, 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 black. Um, that makes us suspicious of you. Right. <laughs> like, well, we might fuck with you, but there's always that like we're waiting for the other foot to drop. And God help you if it does. For for so well, I grew up in in Los Angeles during the height of busing public students to public high schools. The high school I went to had one of the largest uh, kids per class ratios in Los Angeles. And we had people busing in from all over, including East Los, South Central, Compton, and all that. It was, you know, it, it was not, there, there were clashes going on. Watching the higher middle class kids suddenly be like walking in all like yo brother what's going on ah. and acting and acting like seth green and can't hardly wait yes i was just thinking that these kids were tolerated for a week or two and then all of a sudden they're showing up wearing their baseball cap normal. They're not wearing baggy jeans anymore. They're wearing like Levi's 501s. And because they probably got a stern talking to her, they got the shit kicked out of them. If you are embraced by a culture and brought into a culture, that is one thing. And if they allow you to either appropriate that or give that to you is one thing. Don't go off and get a fucking shark's tooth Maori tattoo because you think it's rad and like you're a surfer bud and you heard that it's like all right because if you put the shark teeth and like sharks won't get you because that is a cultural representation of somebody else. Yeah. However, if a Maori tattoo artist says, yeah, that's fucking cool or they give you a green stone to wear or just any number of things. If you are brought into a community, that's one thing. Don't try to adapt yourself to a community for fucking views as a character while you play fucking video games on Twitch. Why use AAVE when, wa when Wave works just as well, Buster? Right! Right. <laughs> Golly, Yo, we we love Wave. Y'all have y'all have some fucking bankers in Wave. Dude, I I was born in the San Fernando Valley. I lived through the early 80s. I speak fluent Valley, dude, and rad. Like I can it, it's 
Watch Encino Man, I can do Polly Shore. <laughs> it's like, it's that kind of thing. But that is because that is how I grew up. I would not turn to somebody and then like I would not do the yo dog what's up hey my brother you know it's like no because that Cha, it, bro. It, yeah right <laughs> but I will 100% call things rad dude like it's and it's like I need to stop the dudes because I will call everybody dude and that can be bad uh, because dude is a uh, is a pronoun but but like it's like I, I've slipped into tubular, but also Canadian. So I, I throw in a lot of A's and hosers and car park and two fours and stuff like that. I call my I call my driveway a laneway. It, it's just there it's it's a stupid fucked up combination of things. But I'm not attempting to appropriate anything into my vernacular. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not trying to use another culture's vernacular. I'm not it, it's just like it, it fucking bugs me and it's not my place to call it out necessarily. It's my place to say, dude, that's not cool. It is not my place to be militant. Enough. I mean, because and- that, then I would be stepping on another culture's, uh, uh, you know, it's like, I can point it out. I can say, dude, that's not cool. People won't fucking like that. You need to stop. But, I I do not give the punishment. That and is just, the culture that does it. And just to give some insight as to why this is a thing, this is why we 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 say, hey, chill out on using A A V E. When white folks use A A V E, you get to you get the benefit of your whiteness. Oh, like, oh, you're still a white guy, but you use it A A V E, and you can take fucking it. P. And yep. you can take it off when it's convenient. Yes. Like you are you are wearing blackness as a shirt, but when shit gets real, you can take that shirt off and you don't you're not stuck with it. Mm-hmm. Right. This is who we are. This is how we talk. This is how we move. And we get judged for it. And there's nothing I can do to stop being perceived as black. And so I have to deal with the benefits and the consequences of it always. I can't choose when it benefits me and when it doesn't. Yeah. That's why when folks do it that aren't of the culture, I'm looking at, um, she was in Shang-Chi. Uh, Aquafina? I, yeah, Aquafina. I'm looking at folks like Aquafina. When you do it for monetary gain, but then like Disney comes and goes, we want you in our latest Marvel movie, but we're not going to have you talking like that. Suddenly... Oh, I grew up like that goes away and you get right. the check. Right. Uh, for some of us, we can't stop talking like that. Like I slip fam and some other words I probably shouldn't say as much <laughs> because that's just how I grew up, you know, but yeah. Yeah, no, but <laughs> like I can, I can go from this and be like, Hey man, you know what's, it's like, yo dog, I can't do AAVE, but you know, imagine that. <laughs> And then all of a sudden, I was it's appreciating like, the tip. It was the attempt I immediately go into, dude. It's like, hey man, what's going on, dude? So you know, I was in it, and it's like, fuck no, because I can't do it. I flip, I slip into, dude. But I can be doing this, and then a cop rolls up, and all of a sudden, I'm hello, a white, officer. I'm, I'm white passing <laughs> with a cap on and old man glasses, going, "May I help you, officer?" <laughs> yeah, I, 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 you know, I turn down public enemy. And I turn up Kenny Chesney. I mean, it's just like, it's just one of those things because I can do this because I'm incredibly white passing. You know, and, and I, yeah. I get pulled over blasting Hootie and the Blowfish and it doesn't matter. <laughs> Cause <I'm> st- <laughs> exactly. Cause yeah, it's like, yeah. Arrested I'm bumping the Dave class. Matthews yeah. man, but I'm still <laughs> um. It's like, no officer. I was listening to a Grateful Dead. Get out oh, of the car. When, when white folks use AAVE, they make a million. When black folks use it, they get fired. You're right. You're absolutely right, Lamia. Uh, oh, and that, yeah. And that's Sorry, gonna, I'm not paying attention to chat. No, so. it's all good. No, you get. And My that's going to bring us. It. That's actually going to bring us to our final question, which I am super excited for. 
Uh, well, there's one last thing after, but it's it's much shorter. Uh, if you've been in the TTRPG space for long enough, you've probably had the displeasure of sitting at a table with a that guy. A that guy is a veritable black hole of fun, someone that if they were yeeted into the sun, your experience at the table would improve tenfold. So, I have to ask you, do you have a that guy story for us? 40 years of them. <laughs> I have sat at table with uh, people that I thought were cool that turned out to be violent racists. Sat at people who seemed to be cool and they were gatekeeping misogynistic shitbags. Um, do I have to name names? Oh no, no. This is you can okay. you tell us the story in whatever way is comfortable for you. I was in a game and it was uh either a first time DM or a uh like like hadn't dm'd very long and i was in a game and they were using all the cool new tools and all this thing and everything was going everything was going all right but the the adventure they were playing they they were running us through was way above ken for what they should have been doing it is it's it's not a it's not a simple adventure it's an adventure it's a module it's a setting that runs from like first level to up higher with a main protagonist that happens to be a vampire you should all know what i'm talking about at this point um it's uh yeah uh, it's it's dnd's dracula mm -hmm. so i'm we're we're getting it's just it was just a small group of people and we're doing it and we're doing it and we're doing it and all of a sudden the dm became like it, it started it started poking out that they were starting to be vindictive and favorable at the same time they would favor one character while the other one would have horrible shit happen like uh all of a sudden you're missing uh you know your uh what should have been a clear perception check turns out not and you know, your, your character almost falls to their death or something like that. And I kept getting more and more frustrated until, and I don't want to use the, my character would do that, but what it was is that it is, it was within the character's thought process that that would happen. I was playing a character that had been formerly um subjugated by uh by another creature and refused to ever go that route again so stood up to big bad and no roles no nothing just whatever and it's like okay well character's dead uh that's it blah 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 i'm like okay cool um and then i left the stream said dm then joined another game i was in as a as a character i think they lasted three episodes before they were called out for their bullshit um Jeez. yeah it was uh i was about to start chewing dice so i put another worthers in my mouth um yeah it was really really bad and the only other example i have is that i was invited onto a short duration show and there was absolutely zero player agency. Oh. I don't care if it's you have a set eight episodes or a set three episodes. Player agency is the key. You can have a linear storyline, but telling having having a pre game meeting and telling people what the story beats will be and how things are going to happen. That's not a game. That's a show. The yeah. dice mean nothing at that point. Your character means nothing to them. At that point, it is a puppet in a story that's already been written. Hey, I left the, that show. It's the why am I here? Yeah. Kind yeah. of deal. Yeah. It's like you can take me out and plug anyone else in with my character sheet. Same shit's going to happen. Th that is a particular pet peeve of mine, uh, and here's how sensitive I am to it. Uh, I was recently in a game where my character did some magic, 
And one of the things that I like to do is I like to kind of express my character's personality in the way that they do game mechanics, which, you know, every any wizard can shoot fireball, but I feel yeah. like you get insight into the character by how they do it. Right. Uh, and so whenever I would cast a spell, the GM would describe how I did my magic. Mm. And I'm like, I don't love this. <laughs> I want to love this, but I can't because you're taking away one of my favorite forms of self-expression. Um, and I just, I don't like people that stifle other people's self-expression, which I, it just, it bugs me. It bugs me to a deep level. I, I encourage descriptions at my games. I'm like, okay, what does the spell look like when you cast it? No one else in the party has ever seen you cast this. What happens and they explain it to a point and sometimes you just you don't have a very imaginative player that's that's not a slight right some people have a hard time embracing a you know embracing the verisimilitude and putting themselves in a fantasy moment and describing that their you know their arms of hadar uh, are summoned from like four black holes that wrap around the creature and begin constrict, you know, things like they don't have that. They're like, okay, I'll cast, I'll, I'll cast Eldritch Blast. Like, okay, cool. What does it look like? He's like, well, it's three bolts that come out. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll take a little Liberty knowing the character. Right. I'll take a little Liberty. Like you see three, you see three bolts of energy that seem to come out like tentacles and then sharpen into bolts. And then I see the player's face light up because I don't overdo it. There are, you know, occasionally I do do that, but I love hearing spell descriptions. I love yeah. doing that. I, I want to, I want to hear you, your paladin, like slicing half of a skull off. I want the fighter to use a disarming attack to try and cut off a toe of a dragon that has their friend pinned underneath it. You know, things like that. I, I want to hear those descriptions because, and this is a weird take. Uh, it, it's not my story. I just set up the world and some shit in it. It's the player's story. I'm the book binding. The chapters are the levels of the characters and the dice are the plot. Yeah. There's stuff that is peppered throughout, but my players can go do anything and anywhere they like. Do they want to quit adventuring and begin farming? Sure. I'll do an entire I'll do an entire arc of them. It is the player's story. I, you know, I just I set up the terrain and they get and they walk through it and tell me what they're doing. And I think that is the difference between a good GM and a great GM. A great GM wants a great GM does everything they can to elicit the story out of you. Like, I don't have any problem with a quiet player at the table needing to be coaxed into getting into the habit of describing their magic or whatever it is that they're doing. The best way to the best way to teach people to do that is to model the behavior that you want them to inhabit. So you know, at asking the question, how, what does this spell look like? And if they don't have an answer, kind of like, all right, I'll give you the foundation to now build upon. So right. seeing that Eldritch Blast become talents, that should inform the player, like, the mechanics of the game have already been established. Yeah. It's on me to color it. Right. Yeah. Throw and, you're going to roll 3d 20 and you're going to do, you know, a, a 1d 10 damage per thing, whatever. But each person does it a little different. And you can establish that fact by just poking at them. You're, you're absolutely right. I have to give a huge shout out to DM Chuck from negative two charisma on the Monday night noir game. I'm in uh, sinner's dream. And also, also my cast on, on leverage. Those are both games where the players are so engaged. One of them, I'm one of the players. The other one, I'm I'm the uh, storyteller. Either Chuck 
or myself can get up, go to the restroom, get some tea, grab a snack, and come back, and the characters are still in the story and talking and advancing the plot and doing everything between them. Absolutely. When you have that lightning in a jar table, that as a GM especially, that you can just lean back, mute the mic. Just let them go. That's that's magic. That's magic right there. And like, yeah. I know so many GMs that aren't fans of the story that they're telling. And that's... But that's okay. That's their table. Well, yeah. he, but here's the, here's the deal, though. Like... Again, I think what separates a good GM from a great GM is a great GM is invested in the story and will do just will do just enough to give the players the means to tell a story that they can become a fan that they become a fan of. Like I I have a Star Trek game. Um it, it's just two players and me. And I came in with a brief idea of like, okay, this is kind of what I want the story to be. I, I knew point A, point B. Mm -hmm. And I liked point A, point B. I'm like, these are, these are things that I dig. Everything that happened from point A to point B was all my players. Yep. And each time something happened, I'm like, oh... Oh, how, this is this is cool. Like, I can't wait for them to get to point B. Yeah, because I don't have a point C. Right, right. They're they're going to define what part C is. So I had the foundation, and then I watched them breathe life into this thing. And so every time we play now, it's just like I want to know what they're gonna do next. Yeah, and like. Yeah. When you get a G, when, 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 as a GM, you give your players enough to breathe, breathe life into the story to the point where you're excited about what happens next. I think that brings an energy to the table. That's infectious. Absolutely. That's what people like watching. That's what people like playing. That's what people like GMing stories that everyone gives a shit about because mm -hmm. there is no matter how good of a, a storyteller no matter how good of a player you are people will always be able to tell when somebody at the table doesn't give a shit right and that is a table killer right fun sponge <laughs> fun sponge fun sponge fun yeah. sponge <laughs> fun fun sponge is the dude at the bar where <laughs> everybody's having a good time they're like hey man what's going on my dog just died <laughs> How you doing? Yeah, it's just like, Shitty. hey, what's going on? Got in a car crash. Oh, sorry to hear that. Has everybody killed a person? It's like, okay. Um, is everything all right? I've taken my meds in four days. It's like, okay, okay, cool, dude. Um, um, check, please. Yeah, um, yeah, fun sponge, dude. Yeah, the guy, the guy at the end of the bar is just like, I hate life, and everyone else is gonna fear me. I, it's that kind of thing, but I, I completely agree. Um, I know we're running short on time, but there are days I wish my home game was streamed. And there yeah. are more games that I'm glad it's not. <laughs> because because though because that's my player's story. Yeah. It's I, not I, people watching it and getting into it and all that. That's that's my player's story. Trevor, stop drinking <laughs> with Batman. <laughs> What? The chat goes, stop drinking with Batman. <laughs> I know, right? It, exactly. It's like, oh, hey, Mr. Wayne, my parents are dead. <laughs> but no, but but look, you have all that money and everything's and everything's fine, right? I'm actually a secret villain, villain vigilante that flies at night and wants to kill people, but can't be Whoa. Buddy. What? Check, please. <laughs> no, exactly. It's, it's exactly. watching. And then all of a sudden, up. you're like, check, please. I bought the bar. Like, oh. <laughs> all right. Then here's the check, Mr. Wayne. Uh, right. Exactly. <laughs> fine. You're buying my shit then, dude. No, I don't have any credit cards on me. I, <laughs> I often relate 
everything to music because I feel like math and music are the universal language. Yep. And I truly believe that there is a inherent quality that artists have where they can take something you're familiar with and just because of the amount that they give a shit, they can transform something that you're familiar with into something that is beautiful. And the example that I like to use with this is uh, Hurt by Johnny Cash. Yeah, Hurt is an amazing song by Nine Inch Nails. No, Hurt is a Johnny Cash song. Johnny Cash played it with his whole heart. Trent Reznor, Trent Reznor it. gave him that song. He's like that is no longer a ninety kids. Yeah, you can yeah. you can feel the difference, and that same that same element is present in the table. When people care, it elevates everything that happens at the table. Like a really good mashup. Yeah. Oh, it's glorious. Isosign but does one. It's Nine Inch Nails, the perfect drug, and Taylor Swift, Shake It Off. So it's shake it off the perfect drug and it's fucking genius. I'm going to have to listen to that. I'll send you the fucking link because one, the oh. video is amazing Two, The song is awesome. And it actually got me listening to Taylor Swift, which was weird, but it, it takes both songs and makes a third that is new and tells a whole new story yeah. and is the sum of the two parts. Yes. It's fucking wild, man. I love shit. A like secret that. third thing. <laughs> yeah, a secret third thing that never existed. Heck yeah. Like that's... Slip Slipknot and uh, Spice Girls. I want to breathe your sulfur. Oh, that, I know that one. That's really good. Yeah, yeah, that that one's yeah. But oh, yeah, I'll send you the link to the ISO sign one. But no, I completely agree, and. It's sad that we all have these dark stories and these it these experience with that guy and everything. But I think, God, this is going to be weird to say at first, but let me explain. I think we need those. Yeah. We need those experiences because that's how you learn. If you had a perfect table all the time with perfect dice rolls and everything, it'd be fucking boring. Yes, it hurts when there's somebody shitty at the table or something happens or a company you believe in for some god awful reason does stupid things. Um, you know, stuff like that. That fucking hurts, but it's a but it's a lesson. Okay, I don't want to be that guy. So I'm going to elevate my style or change my style so I don't end up being that guy. Oh, that table did something horrible and I have a horrible fucking story about them. I'm not going to deal with that table anymore. And I'm going to elevate my play style, my DM style. That I, I don't, if, if someone says, Oh no, I don't have a bad story. They're fucking lying. True. They just don't want to say anything. And I get that. And you don't have to, but let's make sure you learn from that. Yeah, if I, you I, don't, you're doomed to repeat. <laughs> I, 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 I tell folks the reason we do this is because everybody is unfortunately going to have an experience with a that guy. And I want them to use this. I love you, buddy. You got to stop. Bing bong. Oh, I'm sorry. He pressed the sound bar. <laughs> uh, um, uh, I, 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 I want people who have these experience to know that some of their favorites in this space have also gone through it and to not give up on it. Uh, that's why we tell these stories so that, you know, when you, when you do experience a table where you're like, I hate this, that is not, um, that is not what this hobby is. Um, and, uh, that's going to bring us to our final segment here. I just had, I oh, just, I have to say, I just had an experience. Um, watch out where your cat is while streaming and make sure that your stream deck is locked. <laughs> I I don't know why he hit Bing Bong of all things. The cheese because tax was like, right there. I mean, forty five <laughs> seconds of cat butt. I mean, that's one thing. But then it's like, well, okay, Dad, fuck you, Bing Bong. 
Uh, Watson is a menace, uh, a menace to society, <laughs> and he needs to be locked up. <laughs> wait, did he just change? Wait, hold it. <laughs> he just changed screens. Yeah, he that? hit my he hit my he hit my stream deck left, and then ran to Anita. Yeah, that's uh, that's our boy. Forty five hey, seconds Mike. of cat butt is my uh, is my uh, what's the Jared Leto band? It's my Jared Leto oh, 30 cover seconds band. To my Mars. thirty seconds to Mars cutter band. Oh, it was my nickname in high school. <laughs> I love that line. I fucking love that line. Whenever it, something comes up, it's like that was my nickname in high school. <laughs> we got a friend D that just has perfect timing with that joke. But uh that brings us to our community spotlight. And this is a chance to raise up anybody that has made you feel welcome in the space, someone that you feel isn't getting the love uh that they deserve, or just somebody that you really want to give some praise to. Uh, the real Maz face for approaching me at Scum and Villainy a year ago and saying, hey, I have this cool idea. I've got this five-year plan. I'm calling it Open Circuit Studios, and I would let, you're wearing a Dungeon Master jersey, and I'd like you to run a game on it. That has turned into two seasons of Leverage, soon to be three, and into a much larger network that will be, you know, more and more things still starting out. But yeah, it's my, it was my, it's now my first streamed regular show. And without Maz, I couldn't have done it. And they are amazing. They are, they really are. Uh, they give me a shot. They gave me a shot and I, they need more recognition for it. And OCS needs more recognition for it. Yo, check the hat. Heck yeah. um, I couldn't agree more. Right. And so then shout uh, out in chat. So I uh, give them a follow. Yes, please do. And honestly, the other one is my other game. Another small channel, negative two charisma um, and DM Chuck and JD and um, fucking everyone that's on that brunch guild, Justin, uh, grave communications, Eli, um, Adelaide, O Adelaide. Um, Dylan, who's not on Twitter, but he plays Pip, the, uh, the drum, the whole crew. Yes, it is like negative. It's called negative two charisma for a reason, because <laughs> we really are a bunch of chuckle fucks and, <laughs> and fucking idiots. And we do dumb things like letter Kenny themed one shots for yes! charity and stuff like that. The next but, letter Kenny would I, you have to invite me to. Oh, I'll be done, fighting myself. Done. Okay, he's, he, okay, absolutely. That's a, no. a Texas size ten floor, dude. Uh, <laughs> no, well, dude, we would have you on a one shot. We would have you in a campaign, no fucking problem. <laughs> um, but like, but it it started from a weird conglomeration of a handful of shit, and is now it, it's not a powerhouse. It's not anything. We get like, we get twenty six viewers. We feel like we're right. fucking amazing. Um, but like DM Chuck, like after every session, every single session, Chuck does stars and wishes. Yeah. And we congratulate each other and we say what was awesome and what we wish would happen in the campaign. And sometimes he listens to the wishes. Other times he goes completely against them and just like, and the party gets fucked up because it's a, it's a noir story. We're not supposed to win. Right. And we're feeling that and it's existential dread. And he is a masterful storyteller. And the way JD did curse of Strahd, the way Justin ran the letter Kenny games. It's, it's a very small group of folk that we need to branch out and bring more people in. But yeah, those two, those two groups, I wish more people would see what we do. And, yeah. and they're awesome. And uh, dude, also you, to be fair, come on. We, we sat, <laughs> my guitar blocked by a scheme. We, we sat in a star Wars and came up with our own game that over the next year, maybe or so we'll be refined and play tested and maybe we'll throw it up on a stream. But you, I know you saw it when you said that, and I started sketching shit out on a napkin. 
<laughs> you saw my mechanic brain engage and you you kept me going. You're like, no, no, no. What about this? I'm like, yeah, wait, no, that won't work because if we do this power, it's like, okay, cool. You kept, you kept throwing things and I was just feeding off them. And yeah, it may go awesome. It may go nowhere. We don't know. But you gave a creative spark and impetus in that moment that not just affected me, but everybody that knew, everybody that knew the IP we were talking about immediately got in it. And all yeah. of a sudden, eight people from out of nowhere in a Star Wars bar in Hollywood <laughs> started collaborating that. on a, like, yet yeah, no one knows about it except except the eight of us, but on a groundbreaking mechanic for a really wild IP. <laughs> brand, brand new system. We're not adapting a system. Coming up with a brand new system. And yeah, man. And that was that was all you. Hell yeah. Because you're like, God, could you imagine running a game in XYZ? And everyone was like, whoa. <laughs> and immediately I'm like, well, you could do two or three different things that way. No, that wouldn't, bah, bah, bah. and then all, it was just like, you spurred a collaborative moment. And okay. that is what you do. You spur collaborative moments. Every single person that has been on this show has spurned a collaborative moment with you via a story, <laughs> via, a, you know, via a story, via a topic. It doesn't matter if it's 45 minutes or four hours. You're a nexus point of ideas getting out there. And you deserve a way more for way fucking more credit than you do. I just, I just, I, I know people who, who fit like in, in their, in, I, I like being a bridge. <laughs> <laughs> you also bring in people that are antagonistic as well. Yeah. I mean, I mean, because that's the only way to stop them from being an antagonist is if we can find some common ground. Oh yeah, no, you're building a bridge. Duh. Yeah. <laughs> I'm occasionally I'm the person that's like, see the light at the tunnel? That's the bridge I'm burning. Um, but but yeah, man, you need you need way more recognition than you get. Like a hundred percent. Creative people get the recognition. I just sparked the idea. <laughs> that's creativity, dude. That's the beginning of creativity. If you spark the idea, that is the creative moment. That's the impetus. Where people go, dude, your idea is fucking rad. Yeah, but I, I don't have any idea how to put it together. Oh my god, boy. <laughs> that's that's why you build bridges and it becomes a collaborative thing. True. He's got socks. Uh he does. He's, he's got he's, little socks. Uh, he's got a little tuxedo. Um, but on that note, uh, we've been at this for four and a half hours. So we should probably get on out of here and let folks get about the days. Uh Thank you so much for stopping by and hanging out with us, Trevor. And uh, everything has been incredible today. Uh, I've been one of your hosts, Anita. Uh, you know where to find me, uh, at Panita, at Critical Misses. Uh, I'm not going to do the whole outro because we, uh, we got an appointment we got it to. Uh, but Noir. We're getting new tires on our car. Yes. <laughs> Brad, Brad, taking off the winter tires or like just new tires in general? The tires we have now, we keep coming outside and they're flat, so I'm just buying some new ones instead of refilling them every goddamn yeah, time. Yeah, no, you should really do that. Yeah, yeah I don't like driving that much. <laughs> Not that I don't love driving, I just don't like the possibility of being pulled over. <laughs> I'm in LA, I can do nothing but drive. So. <laughs> but uh, I have been your other host, Noir. That's the Noir Enigma. Uh, you can find me everywhere on Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram. Please check out my website, thenoirenigma.com. Uh, we have merch there, some pretty cool stuff. Uh, respect women, juice shirts, and all the like. Uh, if you uh, if you want to help me out, that's how you can do it. Uh, and of course, we have our wonderful guest, Trevor. You are coming back we've got like okay. we've, we've talked for four and a half hours and we're not even a quarter of the way through all the things i want to talk to you about so please tell us where we can find you what you're up to uh, uh real quick it's um on twitter 
uh, at Tattoos and Bones on Blue Sky, if you're lucky to be on there. Um, it's at TattoosandBones.com. Uh, Instagram, at Tattoos and Bones. Um, I'm not on there a whole lot. Uh, you can find me playing Mac the, Gun- the Gunslinging Minotaur Monday nights on Negative 2 Charisma. And then starting up uh, May 31st, we are back on doing weeklies. I am the Game Master for Leverage Los Angeles on Open Circuit Studios. They're both on Twitch. And I have, I believe I have links to them in my Twitter and Blue Sky profiles. Hell so yeah. yeah, that's pretty much it. I'm writing a cool, uh, a bunch of cool stuff in the background, but I can't tell you about them. because I've got some writing projects I'm on as well. I yeah. can't talk about it yet, but it's going to be cool. Uh, yep, no friend BAs thing, here. One other thing I wanted to mention, uh, Next time we have you on, we are telling the story of the hat because it's hilarious. Uh, there may there there may be a pretty cool commercial coming up pretty soon here. Uh, and finally, I don't know how, I don't know when, but I'm going to find a way to get you and Sam uh, together, and we're going to just watch a movie. And I want, I just want to be present while you two dissect the science in a movie. I, what, I is, just, what is Sam's science? What is, uh, Sam, could you tell us what specific science you're like? I, when just I think like Sam, science. I just think general science. It's okay. just everything. So we'll have a paleontologist, a scientist, and I know of a therapist who's also in the space, and I think I'd like to invite them too so we can get all our bases covered. But that being said, that has been this episode of Morning Ritual. We truly hope you enjoy it. Please have an amazing Saturday and Sunday. And Anita, take it away. Until next time, everybody, the ritual has concluded. Bye now! Bye!